The committee will now come to order. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Online content moderation has largely enabled the internet experience that we know today. Whether it's looking up restaurant reviews on Yelp, catching up on SNL on YouTube, or checking in on a friend or a loved one on social media, these are all experiences that we've come to know and rely on. And the platforms we go to to do these things have been enabled by user-generated content, as well as the ability of these companies to moderate that content and create communities. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has enabled that ecosystem to evolve. By giving online companies the ability to moderate content without equating them to the publisher or speaker of that content, we've enabled the creation of massive online communities of millions and billions of people to come together and interact. Today, this committee will be examining that world that Section 230 has enabled, both the good and the bad. I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing before us today. Each of you represents important perspectives related to the content moderation in the online ecosystem. Many of you bring up complex concerns in your testimony, and I agree that this is a complex issue. I know that some of you have argued that Congress should amend 230 to address things such as online criminal activity, disinformation, and hate speech, and I agree these are serious issues. Like too many other communities, my hometown of Pittsburgh has seen what unchecked hate can lead to. Almost a year ago, our community suffered the most deadly attack on Jewish Americans in our nation's history. The shooter did so after posting a series of anti-Semitic remarks on a fringe site before finally posting that he was going in. A similar attack occurred in New Zealand, and the gunman streamed his despicable acts on social media sites. And while some of these sites moved to quell that spread of that content, many didn't move fast enough and the algorithms meant to help sports highlights and celebrity selfies go viral helped amplify a heinous act. In 2016, we saw similar issues when foreign adversaries used the power of these platforms against us to disseminate disinformation and foment doubt in order to sow division and instill distrust in our leaders and institutions. Clearly, we all need to do better. And I would strongly encourage the witnesses before us that represent these online platforms and other major platforms to step up. The other witnesses on the panel bring up serious concerns with the kind of content available on your platforms and the impact that content is having on society. And as they point out, some of those impacts are very disturbing. You must do more to address these concerns. That being said, Section 230 doesn't just protect the largest platforms or the most fringe websites. It enables comment sections on individual blogs, people to leave honest and open reviews, and free and open discussion about controversial topics. The kind of ecosystem that has been enabled by more open online discussions has enriched our lives and our democracy. The ability of individuals to have voices heard, particularly marginalized communities, cannot be understated. The ability of people to post content that speaks truth to power has created political movements in this country and others that have changed the world we live in. We all need to recognize the incredible power this technology has for good, as well as the risks we face when it's misused. I want to thank you all again for being here, and I look forward today to our discussion. And I'd not, not like to yield the balance of my time to my good friend, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. In April 2018, Mark Zuckerberg came before Congress and said, it was my mistake and I'm sorry, when pushed about Facebook's role in allowing Russia to influence the 2016 presidential election. 
Fast forward 555 days. I fear that Mr. Zuckerberg may not have learned from his mistake. Recent developments confirm what we have all feared. Facebook will continue to allow ads that push falsehoods and lies, once again making its online ecosystem fertile ground for election interference in 2020. The decision to remove blatantly false information should not be a difficult one. The choice between deep fakes, hate speech, online bullies, and a fact-driven debate should be easy. If Facebook doesn't want to play referee about the truth in political speech, then they should get out of the game. I hope this hearing produces a robust discussion because we need it now more than ever. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. General Lady yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Latta, ranking member for the subcommittee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing, and thank you very much to our witnesses for appearing before us. And again, welcome to today's hearing on content moderation and a review of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This hearing is a continuation of a serious discussion we began last session as to how Congress should examine the law and ensure accountability and transparency for the hundreds of millions of Americans using the Internet today. We have an excellent panel of witnesses that represent a balanced group of stakeholders who perform work closely tied to Section 230. They range from large to small companies, as well as academics and researchers. Let me be clear, I'm not advocating that Congress repeal the law. Nor am I advocating for Congress to consider niche carve-outs that could lead to a slippery slope of the death by a thousand cuts that some have argued up in the internet industry if the law was entirely repealed. But before we discuss whether or not Congress should make modest, nuanced modifications to the law, we should first understand how we got to this point. It is important to look at Section 230 in context and when it was written. At the time, the decency portion of Telecom Act of 1996 included other prohibitions on objectionable or lewd content that polluted the early Internet. Provisions that were written to target obscene content were ultimately struck down by the Supreme Court, but the Section 230 provisions remained. Notably, CDA 230 was intended to encourage Internet platforms that interactive computer services like CompuServe, America Online, to proactively take down offensive contact. Content. As Chris Cox stated on the House floor, we want to encourage people like Prodigy, like CompuServe, like America Online, like the new Microsoft Network to do everything possible for us, the consumer, to help us control at the portals of our computer, at the front door of our house, what comes in and what our children see. It is unfortunate, however, that the courts took such a broad interpretation of Section 230, simply granting a broad liability protection without platforms having to demonstrate that they are doing, quote, everything possible. Instead of encouraging use of the sword that Congress envisioned, numerous, numerous platforms have hidden behind the shield and used procedural tools to avoid litigation with having, without having to take the responsibility. Nor, not only are good Samaritans sometimes being selective in taking down harmful or illegal activity, but Section 230 has been interpreted so broadly that bad Samaritans can skate by without accountability. That's not to say all platforms never use the tools afforded by Congress. Many do, a great, do great things. Many of the bigger platforms mean billions, and that's what a B accounts annually. But oftentimes, these instances are the exception, not the rule. Today, we will dig deeper into those examples and learn how platforms decide to remove content, whether it's with the tools provided by Section 230 or with their own self-constructed terms of service. Under either authority, we should be encouraging enforcement to continue. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this important hearing so that we can have an open discussion on Congress's intent of CDA 230 and if we should reevaluate the law. We must ensure that platforms are held reasonably accountable for activity, activity on their platform without drastically act, uh, affecting the innovative startups. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I should have mentioned this is a joint hearing uh, between our committee and the Con uh, Committee on Consumer Protection and Commerce, and uh, I would like to recognize the chair of that committee uh, for five minutes, Ms. Shekowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, and thank all the panelists for being here today. The uh, Internet certainly has improved our lives in many, many ways and enabled Americans to more actively participate in, social, in society, education, and, uh, and commerce. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act 
has been at the heart of the United States internet policy for over 20 years. Many say that this law allowed free speech to flourish, allowing the internet, um, the internet to, to grow into what it is today. In the early days of the internet, it was intended to encourage online platforms to moderate user-generated uh, content, to remove offensive, dangerous, and, uh, or illegal content. The internet has come a long way since the law was first enacted. The amount uh, and sophistication of user postings has increased exponentially. Unfortunately, the number of Americans who report experiencing extremism, extreme online harassment, which includes sexual harassment, stalking, bullying, and threats of violence, have gone up over the last two years. 37% of users say that they have experienced that this year. The, uh, likewise, extremis, extreme, uh, extremism, hate speech, uh, election interference, and other prob problematic content is proliferating. The spread of such content is problematic, that's for sure, and actually causes some real harm. Um, that multi-billion dollar companies like Facebook, Google, and Twitter can't or won't fix. And if this weren't enough, cause, uh, if this weren't enough cause for concern, more for-profit businesses are attempting to use uh, Section 230 as a liability shield and uh, actively that they can, that they have nothing to do with um, third-party content or content moderation policy. In, recent, in, in a recent Washington Post article, Uber um, executives seem to be open, opening the door to claims, to claiming vast immunity from labor, criminal, and local traffic liability based on Section 230. This would represent a major unraveling of uh, 200 years of social contract uh, community, uh, social contracts, community governance, and congressional intent. Although, uh, also um, at issue is the Federal Trade Commission's Section 5 authority um, on unfair or deceptive practices. The FTC pursues Section 5 cases on website gener generated content, but the terms of service violations for third party content may also be precluded by the 230 uh, immunity. I wanted to talk a bit about in, uh, injecting 230 into trade agreements. It seems to me that we've already seen that now in the Japan um, trade agreement, and there is a real push to include that now in the Mexico, Canada, US trade agreement. There is no place for that. I think that the uh, laws in these other countries um, don't really accommodate um, what the United States has done about 230. The other thing is we are having a discussion right now, an important conversation about 230. And in the midst of that conversation, because of all the new developments, I think it is just inappropriate right now, at this moment, to insert this um, liability protection um, into, uh, in, into trade agreements. And as a member of the working group that is helping to <laughs> negotiate that agreement, um, I am pushing hard to make sure that it just isn't there. I don't think we need to um, have any um, adjustment to 230. It just should not be in, in trade agreements. So all of the uh, issues that we are talking about today indicate that there may be a larger problem that 230 no longer um, is achieving the goal of encouraging platforms to protect their users. And today, I hope that we can discuss holistic solutions. 
not talking about eliminating 230, but having a new look at that in the light of the many changes that we are seeing into the world of big tech right now. We um, want to, um, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and how it can may be made even better for consumers. And I yield back, thank you. General Lady yields back. Chair now recognizes the uh, ranking member of the committee, Ms. Uh, McMorris Rogers. Good morning. Welcome to today's joint hearing on online content management. As a Republican leader on the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee, it's my priority to protect consumers while preserving the ability for small businesses and startups to innovate. In that spirit, today we are discussing online platforms in Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. In the early days of the internet, two companies were sued for content posted on their website by users. One company sought to moderate content on their platform, the other did not. In deciding these cases, the court found the company that did not make any content decisions was immune from liability, but the company that moderated content was not. It was after these decisions that Congress created Section 230. Section 230 is intended to protect, quote, interactive computer services from being sued over what users post while also allowing them to moderate content that may be harmful, illicit, or illegal. This liability protection has played a, critically, a critical and important role in the way we regulate the internet. It's allowed small businesses and innovators to thrive online without the fear of frivolous lawsuits from bad actors looking to make a quick buck. Section 230 is also largely misunderstood. Congress never intended to provide immunity only to websites who are, quote, neutral. Congress never wanted platforms to simply be neutral uh, conduits, but in fact wanted platforms to moderate content. The liability protection also extended to allow platforms to make good faith efforts to moderate material that is obscene, lewd, excessively violent, or harassing. There is supposed to be a balance to the use of Section 230. Small internet companies enjoy a safe harbor to innovate and flourish online, while also incentivizing companies to keep the internet clear of offensive and violent content by empowering these platforms to act and to clean up their own site. The internet also revolutionized the freedom of speech by providing a platform for every American to have their voice heard and to access an almost infinite amount of information at their fingertips. Medium and other online blogs have provided a platform for anyone to write an op-ed. Wikipedia provides free, in-depth information on almost any topic you can imagine through mostly user-generated and moderated content. Companies that started in dorm rooms and garages are now global powerhouses. We take great pride in being the global leader in tech and innovation. But while some of our biggest companies certainly have grown, have they matured? Today it's often difficult to go online without seeing harmful, disgusting, or somewhat illegal content. To be clear, I fully support free speech and believe society strongly benefits from open dialogue and free expression online. I know that there's been some calls for big government to mandate or dictate free speech or ensure fairness online, and it's coming from both sides of the aisle. Though I share similar concerns that others have expressed, that are driving some of these policy proposals, I do not believe these proposals are consistent with the First Amendment. Republicans successfully fought to repeal the FCC's Fairness Doctrine for broadcast regulation during the 1980s. And I strongly caution against advocating for a similar doctrine online. It should not be the FCC, FTC, or any government agency's job to moderate free speech online. Instead, we should continue to provide oversight of big tech and their use of Section 230 and encourage constructive discussions on the responsible use of content moderation. This is a very important question that we're going to explore today with everyone on the panel. How do we ensure that companies with enough resources are responsibly earning their liability protection? We want companies to benefit not only from the shield, but also use the sword Congress afforded them to rid their sites of harmful content. 
I understand it's a delicate issue and certainly very nuanced. I wanna be very clear. I'm not for gutting Section 230. It's essential for consumers and ent entities in the internet ecosystem. Misguided and, and hasty attempts to amend or even repeal Section 230 for bias or other reasons could have unintended consequences for free speech and the ability for small businesses to provide new and innovative services. But at the same time, it's clear we've reached a point where it's incumbent upon us as policymakers to have a serious and thoughtful discussion about achieving the balance on Section 230. I thank you for the time and I yield back. General Lady yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. The internet is one of the single greatest human innovations. It promotes free expression, connections, and community. It also fosters economic opportunity with trillions of dollars exchanged online every year. And one of the principal laws that paved the way for the internet to flourish is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which of course passed as part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And we enacted this section to give platforms the ability to moderate their sites to protect consumers without excessive risk of litigation. And to be clear, Section 230 has been an incredible success. But in the 20 years since Section 230 became law, the internet has become more complex and sophisticated. In 1996, the global internet reached only 36 million users, or less than 1% of the world's population. Only one in four Americans reported going online every day. Compare that to now, when nearly all of us are online almost every hour that we're not sleeping. Earlier this year, the internet passed 4.39 billion users worldwide. And here in the US, there are about 230 million smartphones that provide Americans instant access to online platforms. The internet has become a central part of our social, political, and economic fabric in a way that we couldn't have dreamed of when we passed the Telecommunications Act. And with that complexity and growth, we also have seen the darker side of the internet grow. Online radicalization has spread, leading to mass shootings in our schools, churches, and movie theaters. International terrorists are using the internet to groom recruits. Platforms have been used for the illegal sale of drugs, including those that sparked the opioid epidemic. Foreign governments and fraudsters have pursued political disinformation campaigns using new technology like deep fakes designed to sow civil unrest and disrupt democratic elections. And there are constant attacks against women, people of color, and other minority groups. And perhaps most despicable of all is the growth in the horrendous sexual exploitation of children online. In 1998, there were 3,000 reports of material depicting the abuse of children online. Last year, 45 million photo and video reports were made. And while platforms are now better at detecting and removing this material, recent reporting shows that law enforcement officers are overwhelmed by the crisis. And these are all issues that we can't ignore, and tech companies need to step up with new tools to help address these serious problems. Each of these issues demonstrates how online content moderation has not stayed true to the values underlying Section 230 and has not kept pace with the increasing importance of a global internet. And there's no easy solution to keep this content off the internet. As policymakers, I'm sure we all have our ideas about how we might tackle the symptoms of poor content moderation online, while also protecting free speech. But we must seek to fully understand the breadth and depth of the internet today, how it's changed and how it can be made better. And we have to be thoughtful, careful, and bipartisan in our approach. So it's, it's with that in mind that I was disappointed that Ambassador Lighthizer, U.S. Trade Representative, refused to testify today. The U.S. has included language similar to Section 230 in the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement and the U.S.-Japan Trade Agreement. Ranking Member Walden and I wrote to the ambassador in August raising concerns about why the USTR has included this language in trade deals as we debate them across the nation. And I was hoping to hear his perspective on why he believes that that was appropriate. Because including provisions in trade agreements that are controversial to both Democrats and Republicans is not the way to get support from Congress, obviously. So hopefully the ambassador will be more responsive to bipartisan requests in the future. Uh, and that, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Oh, um, could, could mine be made part of the? I, apo I apologize. Uh, the chair now yields to my good friend, <laughs> the ranking member. Oh, how times have changed. Um, <laughs>
<laughs> for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to welcome our witnesses today. Thank you for being here. It's really important work. And I, I will tell you at the outset, we've got another subcommittee meeting upstairs, so I'll be bouncing in between. But I have all your, your testimony. We really look forward to, to your comments. Uh, it's without a question a balanced roster of experts in this field, so we're really blessed to have you here. And last Congress, we held significant hearings that jump-started the discussion on the state of online protections, as well as the legal basis underpinning the modern internet ecosystem, as you've heard today, and of course the future of content moderation as algorithms now determine much of what we see online. That's an issue our constituents want to know more about. Today, uh, we'll undertake a deeper review of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act portion of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Um, in August of this year, as you just heard, uh, Chairman Pallone and I raised the issue of the appearance of export language mirroring Section 230 in trade agreements. We did that in a letter to the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. We expressed concerns of this Internet policy being taken out of the context of its intent, and that in the future, the Office of the United States Trade Representative should consult our committee in, advancing, in advance of negotiating on these very issues. Unfortunately, we have learned that derivative language of Section 230 appeared in an agreement with Japan and continues to be advanced in other discussions. We're very frustrated about that, and I hope the administration's paying attention and listening, because they haven't up to this point on this matter. The USTR does not appear to be reflecting the scrutiny uh, the administration itself says they're applying to how CDA 230 is being utilized in American society. That makes it even more alarming for the USTR to be exporting such policies without the involvement of this committee. Be clear, this section of the 96 Telecom Act served as a foundation for the information age. So we're here by no means to condemn, but rather to understand what truly is and see that the entirety of this section is faithfully followed rather than cherry picking just a portion. But I want to go back to the trade piece. Um, this is, you know, I, I thought the letter to the, to the ambassador was going to send the right message. We're not trying to blow up USTR I, I, or, or USMCA. I voted for every trade agreement going forward. I'm a big free trader. But we're getting blown off on this, and I'm tired of it. So let it be clear. And then we found out it's in the Japan agreement. So, you know, clearly they're not listening to our committee or, or us. So uh, we're serious about this matter. We've not heard from the USTR. Um, and, uh, and this is a real problem, so um, take note. Um, if, we, uh, if we only refer to Section 230 as the 26 words that created the Internet, as has been popularized by some, we're already missing the mark since by uh, our word count, which you can use software to figure out, that excludes the Good Samaritan obligations in Section C2. So we should start talking more about that section as the 83 words that can preserve the Internet. All of the sections and provisions of CDA 230 should be clearly taken together and not apart. Many of our concerns can be readily addressed if companies just enforce their terms of service. To put that in better context, I believe a quick history lesson's in order. Today's internet looks a lot different than the days at CompuServe and Prodigy, and the message boards dominated the internet in the 90s. While the internet is more dynamic and content rich than ever before, there were problems in its infancy managing the vast amounts of speech occurring online. As our friend Chris Cox, former member, the author of the legislation, alum of this committee, pointed out on the House floor during debate over his amendment, no matter how big the army of bureaucrats, it's not going to protect my kids because I do not think the federal government will get there in time. That's his quote. So Congress recognized then, as we should now, that we need companies to step up to the plate and curb harmful and illegal content from their platforms. The Internet's not something to be regulated and managed by a government. Upon enactment of CDA 230 clearly bestowed on providers and users the ability uh, to go after the illegal and harmful content without fear of being held liable in court. Now, while the law was intended to empower, we have seen social media platforms slow to clean up sites while being quick to use immunity from legal responsibility for such content. In some cases, internet platforms have clearly shirked the responsibility for the content on their platforms. The broad liability shield now in place through common law has obscured the central bargain that was struck, and that is the internet platforms with user-generated content are protected from liability in exchange for the ability to make good faith efforts to moderate harmful and illegal content. So let me repeat for those that want to be included in the interactive computer services definition, enforce your own terms of service. I look forward to an informative discussion today on the differentiating constitutionally protected speech from illegal content. 
how we should think of CDA 230 protections for small entities versus large ones, and how various elements of the internet ecosystem shape what consumers see or don't see. So with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing, and I look forward to getting all the feedback from the witnesses, but indeed, I have to go up to the other hearing. So thank so, you very uh, much. So the administration doesn't listen to you guys either, huh? I'll, I'll, uh, my statement spoke for itself pretty clearly, I think. We'll find out if they're listening or not. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I will reiterate that uh, members pursuant to the committee rules, all members' written opening statements will be made part of the record. Uh, we now want to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, Mr. Steve Huffman, co-founder and CEO of Reddit, welcome. Uh, Ms. Danielle Keats Citron, professor of law at Boston University School of Law, welcome. Uh, Dr. Corin McSherry, Legal Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, welcome. Ms. Uh, Gretchen Peters, Executive Director of the Alliance to Counter Crime Online, welcome. Uh, Ms. Catherine Oyama, Global Head of Intellectual P Property Policy for Google, welcome. And Dr. Hani Farid, Professor at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, welcome to all of you. We want to thank you for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, at this time, the chair will recognize each witness for five minutes to provide their opening statement. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to explain our lighting system. In front of you is a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please wrap up your testimony at that point. Uh, when the light turns red, we just cut your microphone off. No, no we don't, but try to, f try to finish before then. Uh, so, Mr. Huffman, we're going to start with you, and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Chairpersons, ranking members, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me. My name is Steve Huffman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Reddit, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to share why 230 is critical to our company and the open internet. Reddit moderates content in a fundamentally different way than other platforms. We empower communities, and this approach reply, relies on 230. Changes to 230 pose an existential threat, not just to us, but to thousands of startups across the country, and would destroy what little competition remains in our industry. My college roommate and I started Reddit in 2005 as a simple, user-powered forum to find news and interesting content. Since then, it's grown into a vast community-driven site, where millions of people find not just news and a few laughs, but new perspectives and a real sense of belonging. Reddit is communities, communities that, that are both created and moderated by our users. Our model has taken years to develop, with many hard lessons learned along the way. As some of you know, I left the company in 2009, and for a time, Reddit lurched from crisis to crisis over questions of moderation uh, that we're discussing today. In 2015, I came back because I realized the vast majority of our communities were providing an invaluable experience to our users, and Reddit needed a better approach to moderation. The way Reddit handles content moderation today is unique in the industry. We use a governance model akin to our own democracy, where everyone follows a set of rules, has the ability to vote and self-organize, and ultimately shares some responsibility for how the platform works. First, we have our content policy, the fundamental rules that everyone on Reddit must follow. Think of these as our federal laws. We employ a group including engineers and data scientists, collectively known as the anti-evil team, to enforce these policies. Below that, each community creates their own rules, state laws, if you will. These rules, written by our volunteer moderators themselves, are tailored to the unique needs of their communities and tend to be far more specific and complex than ours. The self-moderation our users do every day is the most scalable solution to the challenges of moderating content online. Individual users play a crucial role as well. They can vote up or down on any piece of uh, content, post or comments, and report it to our anti-evil team. Through this system of voting and reporting, users can uh, accept or reject any piece of content, thus turning every user into a moderator. The system isn't perfect. It's possible to find things on Reddit that break the rules, but its effectiveness has improved with our efforts. Independent academic analysis has shown our approach to be largely effective in curbing bad behavior. And when we investigated Russian attempts at manipulating our platform in 2016, we found that of all accounts that tried, Less than 1% made it past the routine defenses of our team, community moderation, and simple downvotes from everyday users. We also constantly evolve our content policies. And since my return, we've made a series of updates addressing violent content, deep faked pornography, controlled goods, and harassment. These are just a few of the ways we've worked to moderate in good faith, which brings us to the question of what Reddit would look like without 230. 
For starters, we've been forced to defend against anyone with enough money to bankroll a lawsuit, no matter how frivolous. It's worth noting that the cases most commonly dismissed under 230 are regarding defamation. As an open platform where people are allowed to voice critical opinions, we'd be a prime target for these, effectively enabling censorship through litigation. Even targeted limits to 230 will create a regulatory burden on the entire industry, benefiting the largest companies by, by placing a significant cost on smaller competitors. While we have 500 employees and a large user base, normally more than enough to be considered a large company, in tech today we are an underdog compared to our nearest competitors, who are public companies 10 to 100 times our size. Still, we recognize that there's truly harmful material on the internet, and we are committed to fighting it. It's important to understand that rather than helping, even narrow changes to 230 can undermine the power of community and hurt the vulnerable. Take the opioid epidemic, which has been raised in discussions on 230. We have many communities on Reddit where users struggling with addiction can find support to help them on their way to sobriety. With there a carve out in this area, area, hosting them may simply become too risky, forcing us to close them down. This would be a disservice to people who are struggling, yet this is exactly the type of decision uh, that restrictions on 230 would force on us. Section 230 is a uniquely American law with a balanced approach that has allowed the internet and platforms like ours to flourish, while also incentivizing good faith attempts to mitigate the unavoidable downsides of free expression. While these downsides are serious and demand the attention of both us in industry and you in Congress, they do not outweigh the overwhelming good that 230 has enabled. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Ms. Citron, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you for having me and for having such a thoughtful bench with me on the panel. Um, <clears throat> when Congress adopted Section 230 20 years ago, the goal was to incentivize tech companies to moderate content. And although Congress, of course, wanted the internet, what they could imagine it at that time, to be open and free, they also knew that openness would risk offensive material, and I'm going to use their words. Um, and so what they did was devise a, an incentive a legal shield for good Samaritans who are trying to clean up the internet, um, both accounting for the failure to remove, so under filtering and over filtering of content. Now, the purpose of the statute was fairly clear, but its interpretation, the, the words weren't. And so what we've seen are courts massively overextending Section 230 um, to sites that are irresponsible in the extreme and that produce extraordinary harm. Um, we've seen the liability shield be applied to sites whose entire business model is abuse. So revenge porn operators and sites that all they do is curate users' deepfake sex videos, they get to enjoy immunity or and have from liability. And interestingly, not only is it bad Samaritans who have enjoyed the legal shield from responsibility, but it's also sites that really have nothing to do with speech the traffic in dangerous goods, like armslist.com. Um, and the costs are significant. This overbroad interpretation allows bad Samaritan sites, reckless, irresponsible sites, to really have costs on people's lives. And I'm gonna take the case of online harassment, because I've been studying it for the past 10 years. Um, the costs are significant, and especially to women and minorities. Online harassment that's often hosted on these sites uh, is costly to people's central life opportunities. So when a Google search of your name contains rape threats, your nude photo without your consent, your home address, because you've been doxxed, and lies defamation about you, it's hard to get a job and it's hard to keep a job. And also for victims, they are driven offline in the face of online assaults. They're terrorized. They often change their names and they move. And so, in many respects, the calculus, the free speech calculus, it's not necessarily a win for free speech, as we're seeing really diverse viewpoints and diverse individuals being chased offline. Um, so now, the market, I think, ultimately, is not going to solve this problem. So many of these businesses, they make money off of online advertising. And salacious, negative, and novel content, that attracts eyeballs. So the market itself, I don't think we can rely on to solve this problem. 
So of course, legal reform, the question is how should we do it? I think we have to keep Section 230. It has tremendous upsides, but we should return it to its original purpose, which was to condition the shield on being a good Samaritan, on engaging in what Ben Wittes and I have called reasonable content moderation practices. Now, there are other ways to do it. Uh, in my testimony, I sort of, do, um, sort of draw out some solutions, but we've gotta do something, because doing nothing has costs. It says to victims of online abuse that their, their speech and their equality is less important than the business profits of some of these most harmful platforms. Thank you. Uh, chair now recognizes Dr. McSherry for five minutes. Thank you. Um, as legal director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I want to thank the chairs, ranking members, and members of the committee for the opportunity to share our thoughts with you today on this very, very important topic. For nearly, <clears throat> excuse me, for nearly 30 years, EFF has represented the interests of technology users both in court cases and in broader policy debates to help ensure that law and technology supports our civil liberties. Like everyone in this room, we are well aware that online speech is not always pretty. Sometimes it's extremely ugly and it causes serious harm. We all want an internet where we are free to meet, create, organize, share, debate, and learn. We want to have control over our online experience and to feel empowered by the tools we use. We want our elections free from manipulation and for women and marginalized communities to be able to speak openly about their experiences. Chipping away at the legal foundations of the internet in order to pressure platforms to better police the internet is not the way to accomplish those goals. Section 230 made it possible for all kinds of voices to get their message out to the whole world without having to acquire a broadcast license, own a newspaper, or learn how to code. The law has thereby helped remove much of the gatekeeping that once stifled social change and perpetuated power imbalances. And that's because it doesn't just protect tech giants. It protects regular people. If you forwarded an email, a news article, a picture, or a piece of political criticism, you've done so with the protection of Section 230. If you've maintained an online forum for a neighborhood group, you've done so with the protection of Section 230. If you used Wikipedia to figure out where George Washington was born, you've benefited from Section 230. And if you are viewing online videos documenting events real time in northern Syria, you're benefiting from Section 230. Intermediaries, whether social media platforms, news sites, or email forwarders, aren't protected by Section 230 just for their benefit. They're protected so they can be available to all of us. There's another very practical reason to resist the impulse to amend the law to pressure platforms to more actively monitor and moderate user content. Simply put, they're bad at it. As EFF and many others have shown, they regularly take down all kinds of valuable content, in part because it's often difficult to draw clear lines between lawful and unlawful speech, particularly at scale. And those mistakes often silence the voices of already marginalized people. Moreover, increased liability risk will inevitably lead to over-censorship. It's a lot easier and cheaper to take something down than to pay lawyers to fight over it particularly if you're a smaller business or a nonprofit. And automation is not the magical solution. Context matters very often when you're, when you're talking about speech, and robots are pretty bad at nuance. For example, in December 2018, blogging platform Tumblr announced a new ban on adult content. In an attempt to explain the policy, Tumblr identified several types of content that would still be acceptable under the new rules. Shortly thereafter, Tumblr's own filtering technology flagged those same images as unacceptable. Here's the last reason. New legal burdens are likely to stifle competition. Facebook and Google can afford to throw millions at moderation, automation, and litigation. Their smaller competitors or would-be competitors 
don't have that kind of budget. So in essence, we would have opened the door to a few companies and then slammed that door shut for everyone else. The free and open internet has never been fully free or open. And the internet can amplify the worst of us as well as the best. But at root, the internet still represents and embodies an extraordinary idea that anyone with a computing device can connect with the world to tell their story, organize, educate, and learn. Section 230 helps make that idea a reality and it's worth protecting. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. McSherry. Uh, Ms. Peters, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's an honor to be here today to discuss one of the premier security threats of our time, one that Congress is well positioned to, start, to solve. I'm the executive director of the Alliance to Counter Crime Online. Our team is made up of academics, security experts, NGOs, and citizen investigators who have come together to eradicate serious organized crime and terror activity on the internet. I want to thank you for your interest in our research and for asking me to join the panel of witnesses here to testify. Like you, I hope to hear the testimony of the U.S. Trade Representative because, because keeping CDA 230 language out of America's trade agreements is critical to our national security. Distinguished committee members, I have a long history of tracking organized crime and terrorism. I was a war reporter and I wrote a book about the Taliban and the drug trade. That got me recruited by US military leaders to support our intelligence community. I mapped transnational crime networks and terror networks for, uh, for Special Operations Command, the DEA, and CENTCOM. In 2014, I received State Department funding to map wildlife supply chains. And that's when my team discovered that the largest retail markets for endangered species are actually located on social media platforms like Facebook and WeChat. Founding the Alliance to Counter Crime Online, which looks at crime more broadly than just wildlife, has taught me the incredible range and scale of illicit activity happening online. It is far worse than I ever imagined. We can and must get this under control. Under the original intent of CD230, CDA 230, there was supposed to be a shared responsibility between tech platforms, law enforcement, and organizations like ACCO. But tech firms are failing to uphold their end of the bargain. Because of broad interpretations by the courts, they enjoy undeserved safe harbor for hosting illicit activity. Distinguished committee members, the tech industry may try and convince you today that most illegal activity is confined to the dark web, but that's not the case. Surface web platforms provide much the same anonymity, payment systems, and a much greater reach of people. We're tracking illicit groups ranging from Mexican drug cartels to Chinese triads that, are, that have weaponized social media platforms. I'm talking about US publicly listed social media platforms to move a wide range of illegal goods. Now we're in the midst of a public health crisis, the opioid epidemic, which is claiming the lives of more than 60,000 Americans a year. But Facebook, the world's largest social media company, only began tracking drug activity, drug postings on its platform last year. And within six months, the firm identified 1.5 million posts selling drugs. That's what they admitted to removing. To put that in perspective, that's 100 times more postings than the notorious dark website The Silk Road ever carried. Study after study by ACCO members and others have shown widespread use of Google, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, YouTube to market and sell fentanyl, oxycodone, and other highly addictive, often deadly substances to US consumers in direct violation of US law, federal law. Every major internet platform has a drug problem. Why? Because there is no law that holds tech firms responsible even when a child dies buying drugs on an internet platform. Tech firms play an active role in facilitating and spreading harm. Their algorithms, originally designed well-intentioned to connect friends, also help criminals and terror groups connect to a global audience. ISIS and other terror groups use social media, especially Twitter, to recruit, fundraise, and spread their propaganda. The ACCO Alliance, among others, includes an incredible team of Syrian archaeologists recording the online trafficking of thousands of artifacts plundered from ancient sites and sold in many cases by ISIS supporters. This is a war crime. 
We're also tracking groups on Instagram, Google, and Facebook where endangered species are sold. Items ranging from rhino, rhino horn and elephant ivory to live chimpanzees and cheetahs. In some cases, the size of these online markets is literally threatening species, species with extinction. I could continue to sit here and horrify you all morning. Illegal dogfighting, live videos of children being sexually abused, weapons, explosives, human remains, counterfeit goods, it's all just a few clicks away. Distinguished committee members, the tech industry routinely claims that modifying CDA 230 is a threat to freedom of speech. But CDA 230 is a law about liability, not freedom of speech. Please try and imagine another industry in this country that has ever enjoyed such an incredible subsidy from Congress. Total immunity, no matter what harm their product brings to consumers. Tech firms could have implemented internal controls to prevent illicit activity from occurring, but it was cheaper and easier to scale while looking the other way. They were given this incredible freedom, and they have no one to blame but themselves for squandering it. We want to see reforms to the law to strip immunities for hosting terror and serious crime content, to regulate that firms must report crime and terror activity to law enforcement, and appropriations to law enforcement to contend with this data. Distinguished committee members, if it's illegal in real life, it ought to be illegal to host it online. It is imperative we reform CDA 230 to make the internet a safer place for all. Thank you very much. General Lady yields back. Ms. Oyama, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Doyle, uh, Chairwoman Schakowsky, Ranking Members Lada um, and McMorris Rogers, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate your leadership on these important issues and welcome the opportunity to discuss Google's work in these areas. My name is Katie Oyama and I'm the Global Head of IP Policy at Google. In that capacity, I also advise the company on public policy frameworks for the management and moderation of online content of all kinds. At Google, our mission is to organize and make the world's information universally accessible and useful. Our services and many others are positive forces for creativity, learning, and access to information. This creativity and innovation continues to yield enormous economic benefits for the United States. However, like all means of communications that came before it, the internet has been used for both the best and worst of purposes. And this is why, in addition to respecting local law, we have robust policies, procedures, and community guidelines that govern what activity is permissible on our platforms, and we update them regularly to meet the changing needs of both our users and society. In my testimony today, I'll focus on three areas, the history of 230 and how it has helped the internet grow, how 230 contributes to our efforts to take down harmful content, and Google's policies across our products. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has created a robust internet ecosystem where commerce, innovation, and free expression thrive, while also enabling providers to take aggressive steps to fight online abuse. Digital platforms help millions of consumers find legitimate content across the internet, facilitating almost $29 trillion in online commerce each year. Addressing illegal content is a shared responsibility, and our ability to take action on problematic content is underpinned by 230. The law not only clarifies when services can be held liable for third-party content, but also creates the legal certainty necessary for services to take swift action against harmful content of all types. Section 230's Good Samaritan provision was specifically introduced to incentivize self-monitoring and to facilitate content moderation. It also does nothing to, to alter platform liability for violations of federal criminal laws, which are expressly exempted from the scope of the CDA. Over the years, the importance of Section 230 has only grown, and it is critical in ensuring continued economic growth. A recent study found that over the next decade, 230 will contribute an additional 4.25 million jobs and $440 billion in growth to the economy. Furthermore, investors in the startup ecosystem have said that weakening online safe harbors would have a recession-like impact on investment. And internationally, 230 is a differentiator for the U.S. China, Russia, and others take a very different approach to innovation and to censoring speech online, sometimes including speech that is critical of political leaders. Perhaps the best way to understand the importance of 230 is to imagine what might happen if it weren't in place. Without 230, search engines, video sharing platforms, political blogs, startups, review sites of all kinds would either not be able to moderate content at all, 
or they would overblock. Either way, harming consumers and businesses that rely on their services every day. Without 230, platforms could be sued for decisions around removal of content from their platforms, such as the removal of hate speech, mature content, or videos relating to pyramid schemes. And because of 230, we can and do enforce rigorous policies that ensure that our platforms are safe, useful, and vibrant for our users. For each product, we have a specific set of rules and guidelines that are suitable for the type of platform, how it is used, and the risk of harm associated with it. These approaches range from clear content policies and community guidelines with flagging mechanisms to report content that violates them to increasingly effective machine learning that can facilitate removal of harmful content at scale before a single human user has ever been able to access it. For example, in the three month period from April to June 2019, YouTube removed over 9 million videos from our platform for violating our community guidelines. And 87% of this content was flagged by machines first rather than by humans. And of those detected by machines, 81% of that content was never viewed by a single user. We now have over 10,000 people across Google working on content moderation. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars for these efforts. In my written testimony, I go into further detail about our policies and procedures for tackling harmful content on search, Google Ads, and YouTube. We are committed to being responsible actors who are part of the solution. Google will continue to invest in the people and the technology to meet this challenge. We look forward to continued collaboration with the committee as it examines these issues. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Dr. Fareed, you have five minutes. Chairman, Chairwoman, Ranking Members, uh, and members of both subcommittees, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Technology, as you've already heard, and the internet have had a remarkable impact on our lives and society. Many educational, entertaining, and inspiring things have emerged from the past two decades in innovation, but at the same time, many horrific things have emerged. A massive proliferation of child sexual abuse material, the recruitment and radicalization of domestic and international terrorists, the distribution of illegal and deadly drugs, the proliferation of mis- and disinformation campaigns designed to sow civil unrest, incite violence, and disrupt democratic elections, the proliferation of dangerous, hateful, and deadly conspiracy theories, the routine and daily harassment of women and underrepresented groups in the forms of threats of sexual violence and revenge and non-consensual pornography, small and large-scale fraud, and spectacular failures to protect our personal and sensitive data. How in 20 short years did we go from the promise of the internet to democratize access to knowledge and make the world more understanding and enlightened to this litany of daily horrors. A combination of naivete, ideology, willful ignorance, and a mentality of growth at all costs have led the titans of tech to fail to install proper safeguards on their services. The problem that we face today, however, is not new. As early as 2003, it was well known that the internet was a boom for child predators. Despite early warnings, the technology sector dragged their feet through the early and mid-2000s and did not respond to the known problems at the time, nor did they put in place the proper safeguards to contend with what should have been the anticipated problems that we face today. In defense of the technology sector, they are contending with an unprecedented amount of data. Some 500 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute some 1 billion daily uploads to Facebook, and some 500 million tweets per day. On the other hand, these same companies have had over a decade to get their houses in orders and have simply failed to do so. And at the same time, they have managed to profit handsomely by harnessing the scale and volume of the data that's uploaded to their services every day. And these services don't seem to have trouble dealing with unwanted material when it serves their interests. They routinely and quite effectively remove copyright infringement and they effectively remove legal adult pornography because otherwise their services would be littered with pornography, scaring away advertisers. During his 2008 congressional testimony, Mr. Zuckerberg repeatedly invoked artificial intelligence, AI, as the savior for content moderation, and we are told five to 10 years. Putting aside that it's not clear what we should do in the intervening decade or so, this claim is almost certainly overly optimistic. So for example, early, earlier this year, uh, Facebook's chief technology officer showcased Facebook's latest AI technology for discriminating images of broccoli from images of marijuana. Despite all of the latest advances in AI and pattern recognition, this system is only able to perform the task with an average accuracy of 91%. This means that approximately one in 10 times, the system is simply wrong. 
At a scale of a billion uploads a day, this technology cannot possibly automatically moderate content. And this discrimination task is surely much easier than the task of identifying a broad class of child exploitation, extremism, and disinformation material. The promise of AI is just that, a promise. And we cannot wait a decade or more with the hope that AI will improve by some nine orders of magnitude when it might be able to contend with automatic online content moderation. To complicate things even more, earlier this year, Mr. Zuckerberg announced that Facebook is implementing end-to-end -end encryption on its services, preventing anyone, the government, Facebook, from seeing the contents of any communications. Blindly implementing end-to-end -end encryption will make it even more difficult to contend with the litany of abuses that I enumerated at the opening of my remarks. We can and we must do better when it comes to con contending with some of the most violent, harmful, dangerous, and hateful content online. I simply reject the naysayers that argue that it is too difficult from a policy or technological perspective, or those that say that reasonable and responsible content moderation will lead to the stifling of an open exchange of ideas. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Freed. Well, uh, we've concluded our openings. Uh, we're gonna move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions. Uh, of our witnesses, and uh, I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, well, I have to say, uh, when I said at the beginning of my remarks, this is a complex issue. Uh, it's a very complex issue, and, and I, I think we've all heard the problems. Uh, what we need to hear is solutions. Um, let me just start by asking all of you, just by a show of hands, uh, who thinks that online platforms could do a better job of moderating their content on their websites? So that's unanimous, and I, I agree, and I think it's important to note that we all recognize that content moderation online is lacking in a number of ways, and that we all need to address this issue better. And if not you who are the, you know, the, the platforms and the experts in this technology, uh, and you put that on our shoulders, uh, you, you may see a law that you don't like very much uh, and that has a lot of unintended consequences for the Internet. Uh, so I, I would say to all of you, uh, you need to do a better job. Uh, you need to have an industry getting together uh, and discussing better ways to, to do this. Uh, the idea that, um, that you can buy drugs online uh, and, and we can't stop that, uh, to most Americans hearing that, they, they don't understand why that's possible, why it wouldn't be easy uh, to identify people that are trying to sell illegal things online uh, and take those sites down. Child abuse, um, it, it's very troubling. On, on the other hand, I don't think anybody on this panel uh, is talking about eliminating Section 230. Uh, so the question is, what is, what is the solution between not eliminating 230 because of the effects that would have just on the, on the whole internet, uh, and making sure that uh, we do a better job of, of uh, policing this. Uh, Mr. Huffman, Reddit is, is, you know, a lot of people know of Reddit, but it's, it's really a relatively small company uh, when you, you place it against some of the giants. And, and uh, you host many communities, and you rely on your volunteers to moderate uh, discussions. But um, I know that you've shut down a number of controversial subreddits uh, that have spread deep fakes of violent and disturbing content, misinformation, and dangerous conspiracy theories. Uh, but what would Reddit look like if you were legally liable for the content your users posted or for your company's decision to moderate user content in communities? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, what Reddit would look like would be, we'd be forced to go to one of two extremes. Um, in one version, we would stop looking. We, we would go back to the, pre-230 uh, era, which means uh, if, if we don't know, we're not liable. Um, and that, I'm sure, is not what you intend, and it's certainly not what we want. It would be um, not aligned with our mission of bringing community and belonging to everybody in the world. The other extreme would be to um, remove any content or prohibit any content that could be remotely problematic. And since Reddit is a platform where 100% of our content is created by our users, um, it fundamentally undermines the way Reddit works. It's hard for me to give you an honest answer of what Reddit would look like because I'm not sure 
um, Reddit as we know it could exist in a world where we had to remove all user-generated content. Yeah. Dr. McSherry, uh, you know, you talk about the risk to free speech if Section 220 were be repealed or substantially altered, but what other tools uh, could Congress use to incentivize online platforms to moderate dangerous content and encourage a healthier online ecosystem? What, what, are, what would your recommendation be short of, the, of eliminating 230? Well, I, I think um, a number of the problems that we've talked about today so far, which I think everyone agrees are very, very serious, and I, and I want to underscore that, are actually often addressed by existing laws that target the conduct itself. So for example, in the arms list case, we had a situation where um, what arms list, the, the um, selling of the gun that was so controversial was actually perfectly legal under Wisconsin law. Um, similarly, uh, many of the, the problems that we've talked about today are already addressed by federal criminal laws that already exist. And so sec they aren't, uh, Section 230 is not a, a barrier because, of course, there's a carve out for federal criminal laws. So I would urge um, this committee to look carefully at the laws that actually target the actual behavior that we are concerned about and uh, perhaps start there. Ms. Peters, you did a good job horrifying us uh, with your testimony. Uh, what solution do you offer short of repealing 230? I don't propose repealing 230. Uh, I, I think that we want to um, continue to uh, encourage innovation in this country. It's our, our, our core economic, our core driver of our economy. Um, but I do believe that uh, if a CDA 230 should be revised, um, so that if, if something is illegal in real life, it is illegal to host it online. Um, I don't think that that is an unfair burden for, um, uh, for tech firms. Certainly some of the wealthiest firms in our country should be able to take that on. I myself have a small business. We have to uh, run uh, checks to make sure when we do business with uh, foreigners that we're not um, doing business with somebody that's on a terror blacklist. Is it so difficult for companies like Google and Reddit to make sure uh, that they're not hosting um, an illegal pharmacy? I see my time that, is know? getting way expired, so, but I thank you, and I, I think we get the gist of, of your answer. Uh, the chairman now yields to uh, my ranking member for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thanks to our witnesses. Uh, Ms. Oyama, if I could start with you. A recent New York Times article outlined the horrendous nature of child sex abuse online and how it has exponentially grown over the last decade. My understanding is tech companies are only legally required to report images of child abuse only when they discover it. They are not required to actively look for it. While I understand you make voluntary efforts to look for this type of content, how can we encourage platforms to better enforce their terms of service or proactively use their sword provided by subsection C2 of section 230 to take good faith efforts to create accountability within the platforms? Uh, thank you for the question and particularly for focusing on the importance of section C2 to incentivize platforms to moderate content. Um, I can say that for Google, we do think that transparency is critically important and so we publish our guidelines, we publish our policies we publish on YouTube a quarterly transparency report where we show across the different categories of content what is the volume of content that we've been removing. And we also allow for users to appeal. So if their content is stricken and they think that was a mistake, they also have the ability to appeal and track what is happening with the appeal. So we do understand that this piece of transparency is really critical to user trust and for um, discussions with policymakers on these critically important topics. Thank you. Um, Ms. Citron, a number of defendants have claimed Section 230 immunity in the courts, some of which are tech platforms that may not use any user-generated content at all. Was Section 230 intended to capture those platforms? I keep doing that. So platforms that are solely responsible for the content, there's no user generated The question is, there's no user-generated content and it's they're creating the content? That's the question, would that be covered by the legal shield of 230? I'm asking, is that the question? Right. Yeah, um, no, they would be responsible for the content that they've created and developed. So section 230, that legal shield would not apply. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Farid. are there tools available like photo DNA 
or copyright ID to flag the sale of illegal drugs online. If the idea is that platforms should be incentivized to actively scan their platforms to take down blatantly illegal content, shouldn't keywords or other indicators associated with opioids be searchable through an automated process? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, there's two ways of doing content moderation. Um, once material has been identified, typically by a human moderator, whether that's child abuse material and illegal drugs, terrorism-related material, whatever it is, um, that material, copyright infringement, can be fingerprinted, digitally fingerprinted, and then stopped from future upload and distribution. That technology has been well understood and has been deployed for over a decade. I think it has been deployed anemically across the platforms and not nearly aggressively enough. That's one form of content moderation that works today. The second form of content moderation is what I call the day zero, finding the Christchurch video on upload. That is incredibly difficult and still requires law enforcement journalists or the platforms themselves to find. But once that content has been identified, it can be removed from future uploads. And I will point out, by the way, that today you can go onto Google and you can type buy fentanyl online and it will show you in the first page illegal pharmacies where you can click and purchase fentanyl. That is not a difficult find. This is, we're not talking about the dark web. We're not talking things buried on page 20. It is on the first page. And there, in my opinion, is no excuse for that. Okay, let me follow up, because you said it's anemic when some of the, what the uh, platforms might be doing out there. You know, last year in this room, we passed over 60 pieces of legislation in dealing with the uh, drug crisis that we have in this country. Fentanyl being one of them. You just mentioned that uh, you, know, you can just uh, type in fentanyl and you can find it. Okay, because again, what we're trying to do is make sure we don't have, you know, the 72,000 deaths that we had in this country, you know, over a year ago, and with over 43,000 being associated with fentanyl. So, okay, how, how do we go in to the platform and say we have got to enforce this because we don't want this stuff flowing in from China, and how do we do that? Yeah, well, this is what the conversation is. So I'm with everybody else on the panel. We don't repeal 230, but we make it a responsibility, not a right. If your platform can be weaponized in the way that we have seen across the boards from the litany of things that I had in my opening remarks, surely something is not working. If I can find on Google in page one, and not just me, my colleagues on the table also investigative journalists, we know this content is there. It's not hiding, it's not difficult. And we have to ask the question is that if a reasonable person can find this content, surely Google, with its resources, can find it as well. And now what is the, the responsibility? And I think you said earlier too, is that you should just enforce your terms of service. So if we don't wanna talk about 230, let's talk about terms of service. The terms of service of most of the major platforms are actually pretty good. It's just that they don't really do very much to enforce them in a, in a clear, consistent, and transparent way. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Schakowsky, Chair for the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. O Oyama, you, you said in one of the sentences that you, you, you presented to us that without 230, I want to see if there's any hands um, that would go up that we um, should um, ab abandon 230. Has anybody said that? Okay, so this is, this is not the issue. This is a um, sensible conversation about how to make it better. Um, Mr. Huffman, you said, and, and I want to thank you for, we had, a, I think, a really productive meeting yesterday. Um, explaining to me what your organization does and how it's unique, but you also said in your testimony that um, Section 230 is a unique American law. Um, and, and so, but yeah, when we talked yesterday, you thought it was a good idea to put it into a trade agreement dealing with Mexico and, and Canada. If it's a unique American law, let me just say that I think trying to fit it into the regulatory structure of other countries at this time is, uh, is, is inappropriate. And I would like to um, just quote, I don't know if he's here, from a letter that both Chairman Pallone and ranking um, member Walden um, wrote some, some time ago. Um, to uh, Mr. Lighthizer that said, we find it inappropriate for the United States to export language mirroring 
Section 230, while such serious policy discussions are ongoing. And that's what's happening right now. We're having a serious policy um, discussion. But I think what the chairman was trying to do and what I want to do is trying to figure out what do we really want to do to amend um, or change in, in some way. And so, again, briefly, if the three of you that have talked about um, the, the need for changes, um, let me start with Ms. Citrone um, on what, what you want to see in 230. So I'd like to bring the statute back to its original purpose was to apply to good Samaritans who were engaged in responsible and reasonable content moderation practices. And we can change, I have the language to change the statute that would condition that we're not gonna treat a provider or user of an interactive service um, that engages in reasonable content moderation practices as a publisher or a speaker, so it would keep the immunity, but okay, let me just suggest that yeah. if there's language, I think we'd like to see suggestions. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Peters, if you could, and I think you pretty um, much scared us uh, as to um, what is happening and then how we can make 230 responsive to those concerns. Thank you for your question, Chair Schakowsky. We would uh, love to share uh, some, some proposed language with you about how to reform um, 230 to, uh, to protect better against uh, organized crime and terror activity um, on, on uh, platforms. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about that a lot of, in, uh, a lot of tech firms are involved in is, if, is when they detect illicit activity or it gets flagged to them by users, their response is to delete it and forget about it. Um, what I'm concerned about is that two things. Number one, um, that essentially is, is uh, destroying critical evidence of a crime. It's actually helping criminals to, to cover their tracks mm. um, as opposed to a situation like what we have for the financial industry and, and even aspects of the transport industry. If they know that illicit activity is going on, they have to share it with law enforcement and they have to do it in a certain time frame. I certainly want to see the content removed, but I don't want to see it simply deleted. Uh, and I think that is an important distinction. I would like to see a world where uh, the big tech firms work collaboratively uh, with civil society and with law enforcement to root out uh, uh, some of these evil uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to cut you off just because my time is running yeah. out and I do want to get to Dr. Fareed um, with the same thing. So I, we would welcome concrete suggestions. Thank you. Um, I agree with my colleague, Professor Citron. Um, I think 230 should be a privilege, not a right. Um, you have to show that you're doing reasonable content moderation. Um, I think we should be worried about the small startups. Um, if we start uh, regulating now, um, the ecosystem will become even more monopolistic. So we have to think about how do we make carve-outs for small platforms who can now compete where these companies did not have to deal with that regulatory pressure. Uh, and the last thing I will say is the rules have to be clear, consistent, and transparent. Thank you. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Morris Rogers for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Section 230 was intended to provide online platforms with a shield from liability as well as a sword to make good faith efforts to filter, block, or otherwise address certain offensive content online. Uh, per Professor Citron, uh, do you believe comp companies are using the sword enough? And if not, why do you think that is? We are seeing the dominant platform. So I've been working with Facebook and Twitter for, for about eight years. And so the, I would say the dominant platforms and folks on this panel at this point are engaging in what I would describe at a broad level as fairly reasonable content moderation practices. I think they could do far better on transparency, about what they mean by when they forbid hate speech. What do they mean by that? What's the harm that they want to avoid? And examples. And they could be more transparent about the processes that they use when they make decisions, right, to have more accountability. But what really worries me are the sort of renegade sites as well, the 8chans, uh, whose foment incitement with no moderation, dating apps that have no ability to ban impersonators and have IP addresses. And frankly, sometimes it's the biggest of providers, not the small ones, 
who know they have illegality happening on their platforms and do nothing about it. And why are they doing that? Why are they? Because of Section 230 immunity. So the, the dating app grinder comes to mind, um, hosting impersonations uh, of someone's ex, and the person was using Grindr to send thousands of men to this man's home. Grindr heard 50 times from the individual who's being targeted, did nothing about it. Finally, when they responded after getting a lawsuit, their response is, our technology doesn't allow us to track IP addresses. But Grindr is fairly dominant in this space. But when the person went to Scruff, it's a smaller dating site, the impersonator was again you know, posing as the individual sending men to his home, and Scruff responded right away. They said, we can ban the IP address and took care of it. So I think the notion that the smaller versus large, by my lights, is there's good practices, responsible practices, and irresponsible, harmful practices. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Mr. Huffman and Ms. Oyama, your company policies specifically prohibit illegal content or activities on your platforms. Regarding your terms of services, how do you monitor content on your platform to ensure that it does not violate your policies? Maybe I'll start with Mr. Huffman. Sure. So uh, in my opening statement, I described the three layers of moderation that we have on Reddit. Um, our company's moderation and our team, um, this is the group that both writes the policies and enforces the policies. Um, primarily, the way they work is enforcing these policies at scale, so looking for aberrational behavior, looking for known problematic sites or words. Um, we participate in the uh, cross-industry hash sharing, which allows us to find uh, images, for example, exploitive of children that are shared industry-wide, um, or, or fingerprints thereof. Um, next, though, are, are our um, community moderators. Um, these are the people who, these are users, and then following that, the users themselves. Those two groups participate together in removing content that's inappropriate for their community and in violation of our policies. Um, we have policies against hosting. Our content policy is not very long, but one of the points is no illegal content. So no regulated goods, um, no drugs, no guns, anything of that sort um, control. So you, you're seeking it out, and if you find it, then you get it off the platform. That's right, because 230 doesn't provide us criminal liability protection. And so we are not in the business of committing crimes or helping people commit crimes, that would be uh, problematic for our business. So okay. we do our best to make sure it's not Thank on our you. platform. Um, so Yama, would you address that and, and then just what you are doing if you find that illegal content? Thank you, yes. Um, <clears throat> across YouTube, we have very clear content policies. We publish those online. We have YouTube videos that give more examples and some um, specific ways so people understand. Um, we're able to detect of the 9 million videos that we removed from YouTube in the last quarter, 87% of those were detected first by machines. So automation is uh, one very important way. And then the second way is human reviewers. So we have community flagging where any user that sees problematic content can flag it and follow what happens with that complaint. We also have human reviewers that look and then we're very transparent in um, explaining that. When it comes to criminal activity on the internet, you know, of course, CDA 230 has a complete carve out. So in the case of Grindr, you know, we have um, policies against harassment. Um, but in the case of Grindr, where there was real criminal activity, my understanding is there is a defendant in that case, and there's a criminal case uh, for harassment and stalking that are proceeding against him. And so in, in certain cases, you know, op opioids, again, controlled substance under criminal law, there's a section that says, I think, you know, controlled substances um, on the internet, sale of controlled substances on the internet, that's a provision. In cases like that, where there's actually a law enforcement role, we would, you know, if there's um, correct legal process, then we would work with law enforcement to also provide uh, information under due process or a subpoena. Thank you, okay. My time General expired. Yield. Thank, yield you. Thank you. Ms. Get, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, I really wanna thank this panel. Um, I'm a former constitutional lawyer, so I'm always interested in the intersection between criminality and free speech. And in particular, um, Professor Citron, I was um, reading your written testimony, which you confirmed with Ms. Schakowsky, about how Section 230 should be revised to both, to both continue to provide First Amendment um, protections, but also return the statute to its original purpose, which is to act, let companies act more responsibly, not less. And in that vein, I want to talk uh, during my line of questioning about online harassment, because this is a real 
uh, sexual harassment. This is a real issue uh, that has just only increased. Um, the Anti-Defamation League reported that 24% uh, of women and 63% of LGBTQ individuals have experienced online harassment because of their gender or sexual uh, orientation. And this is compared to only 14% of men and 37% of all Americans of any background have experienced severe online harassment, which includes sexual harassment, stalking, <laughs> physical threats, and sustained harassment. So I wanna ask you, Professor Strana, and also I wanna ask you, Ms. P Peters, very briefly um, to talk to me about how Section 230 facilitates illegal activities, and do you think it undermines the value of those laws, and if so, how? Professor Citron? So let me say that um, in cases involving harassment, of course, there's a perpetrator, right. and then the platform that enables it. And most of the time, the perpetrators are not pursued by law enforcement. So in uh -huh. my book, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, I explored the fact that law enforcement really they don't get the, they don't understand the abuse, they don't know how to investigate it. In the case of Grindr, police, um, there were like 10 uh, protective orders that were violated and law enforcement in New York has done nothing about it. So it's not true that we can always find the perpetrator, nor especially in the cases of stalking, harassment, and threats. We see a severe under enforcement of law, particularly uh, when it comes to gendered harms. And that's really where it falls to the sites then to try to... Right. Protect. Ms. Peters, do you want to comment on that? I just wanted to say that in the in this issue, there needs to be something akin to like a, a cyber restraining order, so that if somebody is stalking somebody on Grinder or OkCupid or Google, um, that site can be ordered to, you know, to block that person from communicating with the other. Okay, and and even under Section 230 immunity, can platforms ignore requests to take down down this type of material? They have. Yeah, but, uh, Professor Citron, you're, you're nodding your head. Yeah, they do, and they can, especially if those protective orders are coming from state criminal law. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. McSherry, uh, sexual harassment continues to be a significant problem on Twitter and other social uh, platforms. And I know Section 230 is a critical tool that facilitates content moderation, but as, as we've heard in the testimony, a lot of the platforms aren't being aggressive enough to enforce the terms and conditions. So what I wanna ask you is, what can we do to encourage platforms to be more aggressive in protecting consumers and addressing issues like harassment? I imagine this hearing will encourage many of them <laughs> to do just that. Um, but you know, we I mean, can't keep seriously. having hearings all the time. No, 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 I understand, absolutely, and, and I understand that. Um, so I actually think that the uh, many, many of the platforms are pretty aggressive already in their content moderation policies. I agree with what many um, have said here today, which is that it would be nice if they would start by clearly enforcing their actual terms of service, which we share a con concern about because often they're enforced very inconsistently and that is very challenging for users. A concern that I have is if we um, institute what I think is one proposal, which is that whenever you get a notice, you have some duty to investigate, that could actually backfire for, for marginalized communities because one of the things that also happens is if you want to silence someone online, may, one thing you might do is flood a service provider with complaints about them, and then they end up being the ones who are silenced rather than the Dr. other way around. Dr. Freed, what's your view of that? Pardon me? What's your view of, 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 of what Look, Dr. McSherry just there, there is There is two issues at hand here. Um, when you do moderation, you risk um, over-moderating or under-moderating. Right. What I would argue is we are way, way under-moderating. Right. When I look at where we fall down and where we make mistakes and take down content we shouldn't, and I weigh that against 45 million pieces of content just last year to Nick Mick and child abuse material and terrorism and drugs, the, the weights are imbalanced. We have to sort of rebalance and we have to try to get it right. We are going to make mistakes, but we're making way more mistakes on allowing content right now than we are on not allowing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to you and to uh, Chairman Schakowsky uh, for holding this very important hearing. You know, I've, I've been in information technology for, for most of my adult life, and uh, uh, social responsibility 
has been an issue that I have talked about a lot. Um, you, you know, in the absence of heavy-handed government uh, and regulating, uh, that that's, uh, I think the absence of regulations are, are is what has allowed the, the internet and the social media platforms to grow like they have, but I hate to, I hate to sound cliche-ish, but that old line from the Jurassic Park movie, you know, sometimes we're more focused on what we can do and we don't think about what we should do. Uh, and so I think that's, that's what we, uh, where we find ourselves with some of this. We've heard from some of our witnesses, accessibility of a global audience through internet platforms is being used for illegal and illicit purposes by terrorist organizations and even for the sale of opioids, which continues to severely impact communities across our nation, particularly in rural areas like I live in, in eastern and southeastern Ohio. However, internet platforms also provide an essential tool for legitimate communication and the free, safe, and open exchange of ideas, which has become a vital component of modern society and today's global economy. I, I appreciate hearing from all of our witnesses as our subcommittees examine whether Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is empowering internet platforms to effectively self-regulate under this light-touch framework. So, Mr. Huffman, in your testimony, you discussed the uh, ability of not only Reddit employees, but its users to self-regulate and remove content that goes against Reddit's stated rules and community standards. Do you think other social media platforms, for example, Facebook or YouTube, have been able to successfully implement similar self-regulating functions and guidelines? If not, what makes Reddit unique in their ability to self-regulate? Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I am only uh, familiar with the other platforms to the extent that you probably are, which is to say I'm not an expert. Um, I do know they are not sitting on their hands. I know they're making progress. Um, but Reddit's model is unique in the industry in that we believe that the only thing that scales with users is users. And so when we're talking about user-generated content, um, sharing some of this burden with those people in the same way that in our society here in the United States, there are many unwritten rules about what is acceptable or not to say. Um, the same thing exists on our platforms. And by allowing uh, and empowering our users and communities to enforce those unwritten rules, it creates an overall more healthy ecosystem. Okay. Uh, Ms. Oyama, in your testimony, you discussed the responsibility of determining which content is allowed on your platforms, including balancing respect for diverse viewpoints and giving a platform for marginalized voices. Would a system like Reddit's upvotes and downvotes impact the visibility of diverse viewpoints on platforms like YouTube? And do dislikes on YouTube impact a video's visibility? Thank you for the question. Um, as you've seen, users can give thumbs up or thumbs down to a video. It's one of many, many signals, so it certainly wouldn't be determinative in terms of a, a recommendation of a video on YouTube. That would mostly be for, for relevance. Um, and really appreciate your point about responsible content moderation. Um, I did want to make the point that on the piece about harassment and bullying, um, we did remove 35,000 videos from YouTube just in the last quarter, and we can do this because of CDA 230. Whenever someone's content's removed, they may also be upset. So there could be cases against a service provider for defamation, for breach of contract, and service providers, large and small, are able to have these policies and implement procedures to identify bad content and take it down because of the provisions of CDA 230. Okay. Well, I've, I've got some other questions that I'm going to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, but let me just summarize with this because I want to stay within my time. Um, and you're going to require me to stay within my time. So, um, uh, you, you know, in, in the absence of regulations, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that takes social responsibility to a much higher bar. And I would suggest to the entire industry of the Internet, social media platforms, we better get serious about this self-regulating or, or you're gonna force Congress to do something that you might not want to have done. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. Matsui for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanna once again thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, Ms. Oyama and Mr. Huffman, 
Last week, the Senate Intel Committee released a bipartisan report on Russia's use of social media. The report found that Russia used social media platforms to sow social, social discord and influence the outcome of the 2016 election. What role can Section 230 play in ensuring that platforms are not used again to disrupt our political process? Ms. Oyama, Mr. Huffman, comments? Thank you. Again, um, CDA 230 is critically important for allowing services like us to protect citizens and users against foreign interference in elections. It's a critical issue, especially with the election cycle coming up. Um, we found on Google across our systems in the 2016 election, um, fortunately, due to the measures we've been able to take and add removals, there were only two accounts that had inf infiltrated our systems. They had a spend of less than $5,000 back in 2016. We continue to be extremely vigilant, so we do publish a political ads transparency report. We require that ads are disclosed, who paid for them, they show up in a library, they need to be... Um, so you verified. feel that you are effective in... We can Something. always do more, but on this issue, we are extremely focused okay. on it and working with campaigns to protect um, Mr. Huffman? Yes, Congresswoman. So in 2016, we found that the, we, we saw the same fake news and misinformation submitted to our platform as we saw on the others. The difference is on Reddit, it was largely rejected by the community, by the users, mm -hmm. long before it even came to our attention. Okay. If there's one thing Reddit's good at, or our community is good at, it's being skeptical um, and rejecting falsehoods or questioning everything, for better or for worse. <laughs> okay. Between then and now, um, we've become dramatically better at finding um, groups of accounts that are working in a, a coordinated or inauthentic right. matter, and we collaborate with law enforcement. So based on everything we've learned uh, in the past and can see going forward, I think we're in a pretty good position coming into the 2020 election. Okay. Dr. Farid, in your written testimony, you mentioned the proliferation of myths and dis information campaigns designed to disrupt democratic elections. This sort of election interference really troubles me and a lot of other people. You mentioned there's more that platforms could be doing about moderating um, content online. What more should they be doing about this issue now, this time? Yeah. So let me just give you one example. Uh, a few months ago, we saw a fake video of Speaker Pelosi yes. make the rounds. Okay? Uh, and the response was really interesting. So Facebook said, we know it's fake but we're leaving it up. We are not in the business of telling the truth. So that was not a technological problem, that was a policy problem. Mm -hmm. and that was not satire, it was not comedy, it was meant to discredit the speaker. And so I think fundamentally we have to relook at the rules. And in fact, if you look at Facebook's rules, it says you cannot post things that are misleading or fraudulent. So that was a clear case where the technology worked, the policy is unambiguous, and they simply failed to they implement failed the policy. To, okay. to YouTube's credit, they actually took it down, and to t Twitter's discredit, they didn't even respond to the issue. Okay. So in some cases, there's a technological issue, but more often than not, we are simply not enforcing the rules that are already in place. So that's a decision that they made not that's to right. enforce the rules. Okay. Um, Ms. Oyama and Ms. Trappen, what do you think about uh, what Mr. Fareed just said? Sure, I'll respond. Um, there are two aspects to this. First, specifically towards Reddit, we have a policy against impersonation. Okay. So a video like that um, can both be uh, used to manipulate people or, or, or serve as uh, you know, misinformation. It also uh, raises questions about the veracity of the things that we see and hear and prompts important discussions. Mm -hmm. So the context about whether around whether a video like that stays up or down on Reddit is really important. And those are difficult decisions. I will observe that we are entering into a new era right. where uh, we can manipulate videos. We've historically been able to manipulate text uh, and images with Photoshop and now yeah. videos. So I do think not only do the platforms have a responsibility, but we as a society have to understand um, that the source of materials, for example, which publication, um, is critically important because there will come a time, no matter what any of my tech peers say, where we will not be able to detect that sort of fakery. Exactly. And Ms. Oyama, now you're going to have 15 Thank seconds. Thank you. I mean, on the specific piece of content that you mentioned, YouTube, we do have a policy against exactly. deceptive practices and removed it. But there is ongoing work that needs to be done 
to be able to better identify deep fakes. I mean, of course, even comedians sometimes use them, but in political context or other places, it could severely undermine democracy. And we've opened up data sets. We're working with researchers to build technology that can better detect when media is manipulated in order right. for those policies to Well, continue. I appreciate the comment. I have a lot more to say, but you know how this is. But anyway, uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Kinzinger for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. We very much appreciate it. It's, it's interesting on the last line of questions of us. You know, one of the best things about democracy is our ability to have free speech and share opinions, but this can also be something that, you know, is a real threat. So uh, I thank the chairman for yielding, and I, and I think it's safe to say that not every member of Congress uh, has a plan for what to do about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, but I think we all agree that the hearing is warranted. We need to have a discussion about the origins and intent of that section and whether the companies that enjoy these liability protections are operating in the manner intended. And I'll state up front that I generally appreciate the efforts certain platforms have made over the years to remove and block unlawful content. But I'd also say that it's clearly not enough uh, and that st the status quo is unacceptable. It's been frustrating for me in recent years that my image and variations of my name have been used by criminals to defraud people on social media, and this goes back 10 years, and literally, I think, could approach in the 50s to 100s, uh, given on the ones that we just know about. These scams are increasingly pervasive, and I not only brought it up in the hearing with Mark Zuckerberg last year, I also wrote him again this summer to continue to press them to act more boldly to protect his users. So I have a question. You know, sources indicate that in 2018, People reported hundreds of millions of dollars lost to online scammers, including 143 million through romance scams. Given what so many people have gone through, it's become more and more important for platforms to verify user authenticity. So both to uh, Mr. Huffman and Ms. Oyama, what do your platforms do to ver verify the authenticity of user accounts? Sure, thank you for the question. So there are, uh, again, two parts to my answer. The first is on the scams themselves. Um, my understanding is, is you're probably referring to scams that target veterans in particular. Um, we have a number of veterans communities on Reddit um, around support and shared experiences. They all, uh, like all of our communities, create their own rules. And these communities have actually all created rules that prohibit fundraising generally. Because the community um, and the members of those communities know uh, that they can be targeted by this sort of scam in particular. And so that's the sort of nuance that we think is really important and highlights the power of our community model. Because I, um, as a non-veteran, might not have that, had, had that same sort of intuition. Now, in terms of uh, what we know about our users, um, Reddit is not, we are different from our peers in that we don't require people to share their real world identity with us. We do know where they register from, what IPs they use, maybe their email address, but we don't force them to reveal their full name or their gender, um, and this is important because on Reddit there are communities that discuss sensitive topics. Um, in those very same veteran communities or our, for example, drug addiction communities or communities for parents who are struggling being new parents, these are not things that somebody would go on to a platform like Facebook, for example, and say, hey, uh, I, I, I don't like my kids. Yeah, I, I understand. Do. I don't mean to cut you off, but I, got, I want to go to Ms. Oyama. Sure, and um, very sorry to hear that that happened to you, Congressman. Um, on YouTube, we have a policy against impersonation. So if you were to ever see a channel that was impersonating you or a user saw that, there's a form where they can go in and submit. I think they upload their government ID, but that would um, result in the channel being struck. On search, um, spams you know, can show up across the web. Search is um, an index of the web. We're trying to give relevant information to our users every single day on search. We suppress 19 billion links that are spam, that could be scammed to, to defend the users. And then on ads, we have something called a risk engine that can actually kick out bad or fraudulent accounts before they enter the system. Thank you. And you know, look, I, I, it's not, I'm not upset about you know, the sites that are like Kinzinger is the worst congressman ever, right? That's understandable, I guess, for some people. Uh, but when you have, again, in my case, somebody that flew, as an example, and there are multiple cases, this flew from India using her entire life savings because she thought we were dating for a year. Um, not to mention all the money that she gave to this perpetrator and, and all these other stories. I think one of the biggest and most important things is people need to be aware of that. If you have somebody 
you know, over a period of a year dating you and never authenticating that, it's probably not real. Ms. Peters, what are the risks associated with people not being able to trust other users' identities online? Um, I think there are multiple risks uh, of that, I, but I want to come back to the, the key issue for us, which is if it's illicit, um, the sites should, should be required to hand over data to law enforcement to work pro, uh, proactively with law enforcement. Um, we've heard a lot today from the gentleman from Reddit about their efforts to better moderate. Um, some of our members were able to go online just the other day, type in a search for buy fentanyl online, and came up with many, many results. Same for buy Adderall online, buy Adderall for cheap without prescription. Those are fairly simple search terms. I'm not talking about a super high bar to get rid of that on your platform doesn't seem too hard, or to have that automatically direct to uh, a, a site that would, would advise you to get counseling for drug abuse. Um, we are not trying to be the thought police. We're trying to protect people from organized crime and terror activity. Thank you, and uh, I'll yield back, but I have a bunch more questions I'll submit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, and, and for the record, I want to say I don't think the gentleman's the worst member of Congress. <laughs> I, I don't even think you're at the very bottom, Adam. You're, you're, you're not a bad guy. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Castor for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Doyle, for organizing this hearing, and thanks to all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, the issue of 230 in the context of this horrendous tragedy, tragedy um, in Wisconsin a few years ago, um, an armslist.com, where a man walked into a salon where his wife was working and shot her dead in front of their daughter and killed two others in that salon and then, and then killed himself. And this is a, the type of hor horrific tragedy that's all too common in America today. Uh, but Dr. McSherry, you mentioned, I think you misspoke a little bit because you said that was, that was all legal, but it wasn't because uh, two days before the shooting, uh, there was a temporary restraining order issued against uh, that, that man. Uh, he went online shopping on armslist.com two days after that TRO was issued. And the next day, he commenced his murder spree. And uh, what happened is, you know, Arms List knows that they, they have domestic abusers shopping, they've got felons, they've got terrorists shopping for firearms, and yet they're allowed to proceed with this. Uh, earlier this year, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that Arms List is immune, even though they know that they are perpetuating uh, illegal content and these kind of tragedies. They said the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that arms list is immune because of Section 230. Uh, they basically said it did not matter that arms list actually knew or even intended that its website would facilitate illegal firearm sales to dangerous persons. Section 230 still granted immunity. And then, Ms. Peters, you've highlighted that this is not an isolated incident. We're talking about child sexual abuse content, illegal drug sale. I mean, it's just, it's gone way too far. So I appreciate that you all have proposed some solutions for this. Uh, Dr. Citron, you've said, highlighted a, a safe harbor that if, if companies use their best efforts to moderate content, they, they would uh, have some protection. But how would this work in reality? Would this be then it's left up to the courts and those type of liability lawsuits, which kind of speaks to the need for very clear standards coming out of the Congress, I think. So yes, it would, and thank you so much for the question. You know, how would we do this? It, it would be in the courts. So um, it would be an initial motion to dismiss. The company would then, whoever's being sued, the question would be, are you being reasonable in your content moderation practices writ large? not with regard to any one piece of content or activity. And it's true that it would then be a forcing mechanism, a 12B6 motion in federal court, to have companies then explain what constitutes reasonableness. Now, I think we can come up right now with all of us, we've come up with some basic um, sort of threshold, what we think is reasonable content moderation practices, what we might describe as technological due process. Transparency, accountability, right, clarity on what 
It is having a process, having clarity about what it is you prohibit. But it's gonna have to be case by case, context by context, because what, what's reasonable response to a deep fake, and I've done a considerable amount of work on deep fakes, uh, is gonna be different from the kind of advice I would give to Facebook, Twitter, and others about how, what constitutes a threat and how one figures that out. How we can use, and I'm gonna think, I'm thinking about Dr. Fareed's testimony about what we do about their certain and issues. And then let me, yeah. and it would be in the public interest, I believe, that if it is explicit, illegal content, that they, they don't, it wouldn't wind up as a, an issue of a fact in a lawsuit. What do you think, Dr. Fareed? If it is illegal content online, there, there really shouldn't be a, a debatable question. Right. I'm not a lawyer, to be clear. I'm a mathematician by training, so I don't think you'd really want to be asking me that question, but I completely agree with you. In some cases, you know, what we have seen over the years, and we saw this when we were deploying photo DNA, is the technology companies want to get you muddled up in the gray area. So we had conversations when we were trying to remove child abuse material saying, well, what happens when it's an 18-year-old? You know, what happens when it's not sexually explicit? And my answer is, yes, those are complicated questions, but there's really clear-cut bad behavior we are doing awful things to kids as young as two months old. There is I'm no issue. I'm going to interrupt you because my time is short. I'm just highlight to the witnesses. There's also an issue with uh, the number of moderators who are being hired to go through this content. The a publication called The Verge had a had a, a horrendous uh, story of Facebook moderators, and it caught my attention because one of the the places is in Tampa, Florida, my district. I'm going to uh, uh, submit follow up questions about of moderators uh, and some standards for, for that practice as follow-up, and I encourage you to answer and send it back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields. And now the chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to be with you. I'm sorry I missed a lot of this because I'm upstairs. But in my 23 years of being a member, I've never had the chance to really address the same question to two different panels on the same day. Uh, so it's, it, it's kind of an interesting convergence. Upstairs, we're, we're talking about e-vaping and underage use and what's in the product. So I was curious, when we were uh, in the opening statements here, someone, and I apologize, unless you're um, mentioned uh, uh, two cases. One was dismissed because they really did nothing, and one the one who tried to be the good actor got slammed. I don't know about slammed, but so I see a couple heads being, can you first of all, um, Ms. Citron, can you address that first? You're shaking it the most. We are enthusiastically, because those are the two cases that effectively give rise to Section 230. So what animates Chris Cox to go to Ron Wyden and say, you know, we've got to do something about this, is two, a pair of decisions in which one basically says if you do nothing, you're not going to be punished for it, but if you try and you moderate, actually, that heightens your responsibility. So the no good deed goes unpunished. Exactly, right. So that's why we're all in heated agreement about those two cases. That's why we're here today in, in many respects. So if I tie this into what's going on upstairs, and someone uses a platform to uh, encourage underage vaping with unknown nicotine content, and the site then decides to clean it up because of the way the law is written right now. They, this good deed, which we most would agree that it probably is a good deed, uh, would go punished. No, no, now we have Section 230. That's why we have Section 230. They are encouraged just so long as they're doing it in good faith under Section 230C2, they can remove it and they are good Samaritans. Right. But so, okay, so that, so that is the benefit of it. Um, is there fear? Okay, so in this debate that we heard earlier in opening comments from some of my colleagues uh, in the uh, USMCA debate, that uh, part of that would remove the protections of 230 and then we would fall back to a regime by which the good deed person could get punished, is that correct? Everybody's kind of shaking their head mostly. Uh, well, Ms. Peters, you you're not. Go ahead. I, I, you get it. Just turn your mic on. Um, we need to keep the 230 language out of the out of the trade agreements. It's it's currently um, an issue of great debate here in the United States. 
um, it's not fair to uh, uh, in, put that into trade agreements that will make it impossible to, for, uh, or make it harder for. Well, don't, don't get me wrong. I want USMCA passed with it, you know, as soon as possible without it being encumbered where it doesn't happen. So, uh, and I'm not a proponent of trying to delay this process, but I'm just trying to work through the, this, this debate it also in, I mean, the, the concern upstairs to so those of us, we believe in legal products. Uh, that have been, me, approved by the FDA, and we are concerned about a black market operation that would then use platforms illicitly to sell to underage kids. That, that would be how I would uh, tie these two hearings together, which, again, I still think is pretty interesting. When, I, when we had the uh, Facebook hearing a couple years ago, um, I, I referred to a book called The Future Computed, which talks about the ability of... Uh, industry to set those standards. I do think that industry, we do this across the board in a lot of, whether it's engineering of uh, uh, heating and air cooling equipment or that, we do have industry that comes together for the good of the whole, for the good actors and say, here are our standards. And the, the fear is that if the, this sector doesn't do that, then the heavy hand of government will do it, which I think would, would really cause a little more problems. Dr. Fareed, you're shaking your head. We have been saying to the industry, you have to do better, because if you don't, somebody's gonna do it for you. So you do it on your terms or somebody else's That terms. would be you us. do it on that your terms, us. I agree. We're not the experts. So I, I, part of that book talks about fairness, reliability, privacy, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. Uh, I would encourage the industry and those who are listening to, uh, to help us move in that direction on their own before we do it for them. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields, and the chair recognizes the chair for five minutes. Um, I would like to, I mean, it's very interesting testimony and uh, jarring in some ways. Ms. Peters, uh, your testimony was particularly jarring. Have you seen any, any authentic offers of weapons of mass destruction being offered for sale online? Uh, I have not, uh, personally, but, but uh, we certainly have members of our alliance that are tracking uh, weapons uh, activity. And I think what's more concerning to me in a way is, is the number of illegal groups from Hezbollah, uh, designated Hezbollah groups to Al-Qaeda that, you know, that maintain web pages and link to their Twitter and, and Facebook pages from those uh, right. and then run fundraising campaigns off of them. Um, there are, there are many, many, in the there, of there are many platforms issue. that allow for secret and private oh. groups. It's inside, those groups are, are the epicenter of illicit activity. So it's right. hard for us to get inside those. We've actually run undercover operations to get inside some of them. All right, thank uh, but you, we Ms. haven't Peters. gotten. Um, Mr. Farrad, in your testimony, you talk about the tension uh, at tech companies between the motivation to maximize amount of time online, on their platforms on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, content moderation. Could you talk about that briefly, Good. please? So we've been talking a lot about 230, and, and that's, a, that's an important conversation. But there is another tension point here, and there is another thing, which is the underlying business model of Silicon Valley today is not to sell a product. You are the product. Right. <laughs> and in some ways, that's where a lot of the tension is coming from, because the metrics we use at these companies for success is how many users and how long do they stay on the platforms. You can see why that is fundamentally um, in tension with right. removing users, removing content. And so the business model is also an issue, and the way we deal with privacy of user data is also an issue here. Because if, we, if the business model is monetizing your data, well then I need to feed you information. There is a reason why we call it the rabbit hole effect on YouTube. There is a reason, reason why if you start watching certain types of videos of children or conspiracies or extremism, you are fed more and more and more of that content down the rabbit hole. And so there, there is real tension there, and it's the bottom line. It's not just ideological. We are at, we're talking about the underlying profits. Okay. Ms. Oyam, would you like to add to that? Thank you. Um, I think many of these issues that we're discussing today, whether it's you know harassment, extremism, it is important to remember the positive and productive um, potential for the internet. You know, on YouTube, we've seen it gets better. We've seen um, counter messaging. We have a program called Creators for Change, who are able to um, create really compelling content for youth to counter extremist messages and. 
I think it's just good to remember, you know, the CDA 230 was born out of this committee. It's been longstanding policy. It is relevant to foreign policy as well. We would support its inclusion in USMCA or any other um, modern digital trade framework. It's um, responsible for the $172 billion surplus the United States has in digital services. It's critically important for small businesses to be able to moderate content um, and to prevent censorship from other more repressive regimes abroad. So it's a great issue, and it's kind of hard to restrain yourself to brief answers. I understand that. Uh, but clearly, companies could be doing more today within the current legal framework uh, to address problematic content. I'd like to ask each of you very briefly what you think could be done today with today's tools uh, to moderate content, starting with Mr. Huffman. Very briefly, please. Sure. Um, so for us, the biggest challenge is evolving our policies to meet new challenges. But as such, we've evolved our policies uh, a dozen times over the last couple of years and will continue to do so um, into the future. For example, two recent ones for us were um, expanding our harassment policy and banning deepfake pornography. So undoubtedly there will be, uh, deepfake pornography wasn't even a word you know, two years ago. So undoubtedly there will be new challenges in the future and uh, being able to stay nimble and address them is really important. 230 actually gives us the space to uh, adapt to these sorts of new challenges. Okay, Ms. Citrin. I'd say so would a reasonableness standard. The, the nimbleness that okay. a reasonableness so I thought you were gonna enables yep. is ensuring that we do respond to changing threats. The threats landscape is gonna change. We can't have a checklist right now, but I would encourage companies to not only have policies, but be clear about them and to be accountable. Okay, Ms. McSherry, or Dr. McSherry. Um, just quickly, the issue for me with the reasonableness standard is, as a litigator, that's terrifying. That means, as a practical matter, especially for a small business, a lot of litigation risk as courts try to figure out what counts as reasonable. To your question, one of the crucial things I think we need if we want better moderation practices and we want users not to be treated just as products is to incentivize alternative business models. We need to make sure that we clear a space so there's competition. So then when a given site is behaving badly, such as Grindr, people have other places to go with other practices. And they're encouraged to, to you know, there's, there's an, um, other sites are encouraged to develop and evolve. That will, you know, make market forces sometimes can work. We need to let them work. Thank you. I'm going to have to cut off my, t my time now, and I'm going to yield. Uh, to the gentlelady from um, Indiana, Ms. Brooks, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for this very important hearing. Uh, Dr. Fareed, um, actually, uh, for, to set the record, um, and the reason I'm asking these questions, I, I'm a former U.S. attorney. I was very involved in the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Um, we did a lot of work from 2001 to 2007, and you are right, Mr. Huffman, deep fake pornography was not a term at that time. Um, and so uh, we certainly know that, you know, law enforcement has been challenged for now decades in dealing with pornography over the Internet. Um, and, and yet I, I believe that we have to continue to do more to protect children and protect kids all around the globe. Um, a, a concept uh, or a tool, photo DNA, uh, was developed a long time ago to detect criminal online child pornography, yet it means nothing to detect that illegal activity if the platforms don't do anything about it. And so now we've been dealing with this now for decades. This is not new, and yet we now have new tools, right? So photo DNA, is it a matter of t tools or effort, or how is it that it's still happening? Dr. Fareed? I gotta say, this is a source of incredible frustration. So first of all, I was part of the team that developed photo DNA, photo DNA back in 2008 with Microsoft. And I will tell you, for an industry that prides itself on rapid and aggressive development, there has been no tools in the last decade that have gone beyond photo DNA. That is pathetic. That is truly pathetic when we are talking about this kind of material. How does an industry that prides itself on innovation say, we are going to use 10-year-old technology to combat some of the most gut-wrenching, heartbreaking content online. It is completely inexcusable. This is not a technological limitation. This is, we are simply not putting the effort into developing and deploying the tools. And, and let me just share 
that having watched some of these videos, it is something you never want to see and you cannot get out of your mind. I agree. Um, and so I'm curious, Ms. Oyama, you wanted to respond and how is it that we are still at this place? Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, I will say at Google, that is not true at all. We have never stopped working um, on prioritizing this. We can always do better, but we're constantly um, adopting new technologies. We initiated one of the first ones, which was called CSAI Match, which enabled us to create digital fingerprints of this imagery, um, prevent it from ever being re-uploaded on YouTube, and we also share it with NCMEC. And there's a new tool that we have called the Content Safety API. It's very new, and we're sharing it with others in the industry, with NGOs. It's um, resulted in a 7x increase in the speed at which this type of content is able to identify. So, um, it's going to continue to be a priority, but I just wanted to be clear that from the very top of our company, we need to be a safe, secure place for parents and children, and um, we will not stop working on this issue. Well, and I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that there have been advances then and that you're sharing them, and that is critically important. However, I will say that an Indiana State Police Captain, uh, Chuck Cohen, who has actually testified before Energy and Commerce recently, told me that one of the issues that law enforcement runs into when working with Internet companies is an attitude that he calls minimally compliant. And he said that... Uh, Internet companies will frequently not preserve content that can be used for investigation if law enforcement makes the companies aware of the concerning materials or automatically flags that content uh, to law enforcement for review without actually checking if it's truly objectionable or not. Do any of you have thoughts specifically on his comment? He has been an expert. Uh, do, do any of you have thoughts on how we balance this law enforcement's critical need because they are saving children all around the globe, um, Ms. Peters, without restricting companies' immunity from hosting uh, concerning content. Um, I just feel like um, if companies start getting fined or some sort of punitive damage every time there's illicit content, we're going to see a lot less illicit content very, very quickly. If it's illegal in real life, it should be illegal to host it online. And that's a very simple approach uh, that I think we could apply industry-wide. And so I have a question particularly because I asked Mark Zuckerberg this uh, relative to, to terrorism and to recruitment and ISIS, and now we need to be even more concerned um, about ISIS. And I understand that you have teams of people that take it down. How many people are on your team, Mr. Huffman? Um, dedicated to... Um, removing content. Yeah, removing content at scale and writing our policies. It's about 20% of our company. 20% so of people. your company, about 100 people. Ms. Oyama, how many people? Um, more than 10,000 people working on content moderation. That actually remove content? That are involved in the content moderation development of the policies or the human... Re but how many people are on the team that actually do th that work? Um, I can, I'm happy to get back to okay, you. Okay, yeah. thank you. With that, I yield back. The gentlelady uh, yields. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce a, a letter for the record without objection. So ordered. Um, next, the, the chair recognizes uh, the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Clark, for five minutes. I thank our chairman and our chairwoman, our ranking members, for convening this jo joint subcommittee hearing today on fostering a healthier internet to protect consumers. Uh, I introduced uh, the first House bill on deep fake technology called the Deep Fakes Accountability Act, which would regulate fake videos. Deep fakes can be used to impersonate political candidates, create fake revenge porn, and uh, theater the very notion of what's real. Uh, Ms. Ogama, Mr. Hoffman, your platforms are exactly where deep fakes are shared. What are the implications of Section 230 on your deep fakes policies? Sure, I'll go. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. So we uh, released, actually I think with most of our peers around the same time, uh, prohibitation, prohibitation of deepfake pornography on Reddit because we saw that as a new emerging threat that we wanted to get ahead of as quickly as possible. Um, the challenge we face, of course, is the challenge you raise, which is the increasing challenge of being able to detect what is real or not. This is where we believe that Reddit's model actually shines. 
um, by empowering our users and communities to adjudicate on every piece of content, they often highlight things that are suspicious, not just videos and images, but also text and news sources. And through, I, I do believe very strongly that uh, we as a society, not just us as platforms, um, but in addition to, have to develop defenses against this sort of manipulation, because it's only going to increase. Yama. Thank you. Um, yes, on YouTube, our overall policy is a policy against deceptive practices. So there's been instances where we have seen these deep fakes. Um, I think the Speaker Pelosi video is one example where we identified that it was a deep fake and it was removed from the platform. Um, for both you know, search and for YouTube, uh, surfacing authoritative, accurate information is core to our business, um, core to our long-term business incentives. Um, I would agree with uh, what Mr. Huffman said, is that um, one of the things that we're doing is investing deeply in the academic side, the research side, the machine learning side, to open up data sets where we know these are deep fakes and get better at being able to identify when content is manipulated. Um, we also do have a, a revenge porn policy for search for users who are victimized by that, and we did also expand that to include um, synthetic images or deep fakes in that area too. Very well. Ms. Citron, could you discuss the implications of Section 230 on deep fakes monitoring and removal? Section 230, um, sort of the activities that um, we've seen YouTube and, and Reddit engage in are precisely the kinds of activities that are proactive in the face of clear illegality, moving quickly, uh, but the real problem isn't these folks at the table. There are now, so Deep Trace Labs just issued a report two weeks ago showing that eight out of the 10 biggest porn sites have deep fake sex videos, and there are four sites now that basically their business model is deep fake sex videos, and that 99% of those videos involve women. So let me um, ask you, does the Section current- Section 230 provides them immunity because it's users posting them. Does the, com the current immunity structure reflect the unique nature of this threat? I don't think the, so Section 230 as it's devised, it's at its best, it's supposed to incentivize the kind of nimbleness that we are seeing for some dominant platforms, but it's not the way the, the plain language is written under 230C1, it doesn't condition the immunity on being responsible and reasonable. And so you have these outliers that cause enormous harm because it can be that in a search of your name that there's a deep fake sex video until it's you know, de-indexed. And it is findable and people then contact you and it's terrifying for victims. So it's really these outlier companies that their business model is this kind of abuse. And Section 230 is what they point to when they gleefully say, sue me, too bad, so sad. Mm. And that's the problem. Very well. Uh, one of the many issues that has become um, ex an existential threat to civil society is the rise of hate speech and propaganda on social media platforms. Ms. Yama, if 230 were removed, would platforms be liable for hosting distasteful speech and would it change their incentives around moderating such speech? Thank you for the question. I think this is a really important area to show the power and the importance of CDA 230. I mean, as you know, um, there are First Amendment restrictions on government regulation of speech. So there is additional responsibility for service providers like us in the private sector to step up. We have a policy against hate speech. Um, incitement to violence is prohibited. Hate speech is prohibited. Speech targeting hate at specific groups for attributes based on race, religion, veteran status, age. And the takedowns that we do every single quarter through automated um, flagging, through machine learning, or through human reviewers are lawful and possible because of 230. When we take down content, someone's content is being taken down. And so they can regularly come back to any service provider, big or small, they may sue them for defamation or other things. Um, I think looking at the equities of the small business interests in this space would be really important as well because um, I think they would say that they're even more deeply reliant on this flexibility and this space to innovate new ways to identify bad content and take it down without fear of unmitigated you know, litigation or legal risk or legal uncertainty. Very well, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman. The gentlelady yields back, and now, um, Mr. Wahlberg, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairwoman, and uh, 
Appreciate the panel being here. Um, today's hearing and the issues at hand hit home for a lot of us, as we've discussed here. Uh, the internet uh, is such an amazing, amazing tool. Uh, it's brought about great innovation, connected millions of people in ways that were never even thought of before. And um, I think truthfully, we look forward to what we will see in the future. But these are issues we have to wrestle with. Earlier this year, I was pleased to invite uh, Haley Petrowski uh, from my district uh, to the State of the Union to, uh, as my guest to highlight um, her good work that she is doing in my district and surrounding areas to help combat cyberbullying. Um, very much um, um, comp comprehensive individual who understands so much as a young person of what's going on and is having a, a real impact in, in high schools and in colleges now as a result of her experience and trying to attempt to make some positive things out of it after she almost committed suicide. And thankfully, it wasn't successful as a result of cyberbullying. Uh, she's signed a, shined a light on that. And so, uh, Mr. Huffman and Ms. Oyama, what are your companies doing to address cyberbullying on your platforms? Sure. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Just two weeks ago, we updated our policies around harassment. It's one of the, I think, most complex or nuanced challenges we face because it appears in many ways. Um, one of the big changes we made is to allow harassment reports not just from the victim but from third parties. Basically, if somebody else sees instances of harassment, they'll report it to us and our team so that we can investigate. Um, this is a, a nationwide issue, but particularly on our platform when people come to us in times of needs. For example, a teenager struggling, uh, struggling with their own sexuality has no place to turn, maybe not their friends, not their family, so they come to a platform like ours to talk to others in difficult situations, or people who are having suicidal thoughts come to our platform. And it is our first priority, regardless of the law, um, though we fully support um, lawmakers in this initiative to make sure that those people have safe experiences on Reddit. So we'll, we've made a number of changes and we'll continue to do so in the future. Okay, uh, Ms. Oyama. Thank you for the question. Um, on YouTube, harassment and cyberbullying is prohibited and so we would use our um, policies to help us enforce and either through automated detection uh, human flagging, community flagging, we would be able to identify that content and take it down. Last quarter, we removed 35,000 videos under that policy against harassment and bullying. Um, and I did just want to echo Mr. Huffman's perspective that the internet and content sharing is also a really valuable place. Um, it can serve as a lifeline to a victim of harassment or bullying, and we see that all the time when someone may be isolated in their school or somewhere else, being able to reach out across borders to another state or to find another community has really um, created a lot of hope and we also want to continue to invest in that important educational um, mental health resources, content like that. Well, I'm glad to hear that you both are willing to continue investing and helping us as we uh, move forward in this area. Um, Ms. Oyama, um, Google's ad network has come a long way in the, in the last few years and won't uh, serve ads next to potentially illegal activity. Uh, this is laudable and demonstrates Google has come a long way in identifying illegal activity. Given that Google is able to identify such activity, why would it not just take down the content question? That was for uh, Ms. Oyama, for, for you. Um, it, it is true that on, on our ad system, we do have a risk engine and so we prohibit illegal content, um, there's many different um, policies and they're stricken, more than two billion ads every year are stricken um, out of the ad network for violating those policies, illegal and beyond. So you're taking them down? Yes, absolutely, before, before they're ever able to hit any page. I think um, it's very squarely in line with our business interest. We want advertisers to feel that our network, that our platforms are safe. Um, they want to, you know, our advertisers only want to be serving uh, good ads to good content. One final question. I understand that Google offers a feature to put a tag on copyrighted work that would automatically take it down if pirated and uploaded, but that Google charges a fee for this. Uh, can this technology be applied to other legal content, and why doesn't Google offer this tool for free? 
Thank you for the question. Um, I think that may be a misperception because we do have Content ID, which is our copyright management system. It is automated. Um, we have partners across the music industry, film, I think every leading publisher is part of it. It is um, part of our partner program, so it is offered for free. And it actually, it doesn't cost the partners anything. It's a revenue generator. So last year we sent $3 billion based on Content ID claims of copyrighted material that right holders claimed they were able to take the majority of the ad revenue associated with that content and it was sent um, back out to them. And that system of being able to identify and detect algorithmically content um, to then set controls, whether it should be in the entertainment space, perhaps monetized and served, or in the case of violent extremism, absolutely blocked, is something that um, powers much of YouTube. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, and Mr. Lobsack, you are um, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to thank Chairman Doyle and Chair Schakowsky and the two ranking members uh, of these subcommittees for holding this hearing today. And I want to thank the witnesses for your attendance as well. This has been very informative. Uh, even if we're not able to answer all the questions we'd like to be able to answer. Um, and it's not the first time our committee has examined how social media and the internet can be both a force for innovation and human connection, which we all enjoy when we're uh, making those connections, so long as they are positive, obviously, uh, but also a vector of harm and criminality. Uh, I think everyone assembled here today is clearly very expert in your field, and I appreciate hearing from you all today as we consider how Section 230 has been interpreted by the court since its initial passage and what, if any, changes should be, we should be considering. I think there's a lot to consider as we discuss the full scope of what Section 230 covers, from cyberbullying and hate speech, whether on Facebook, YouTube, or elsewhere, to the illicit transaction of harmful substances or weapons. I think the question today is twofold. First, we must ask if content moderators are doing enough. And second, we must ask whether congressional action is required to fix these challenges. That second one has kind of been referred to obliquely throughout uh, by some of you and by some of us, but I think that's essentially the second question that, that we're, we're really facing today. And after reviewing the testimony you've submitted, we clearly have some differences of opinion on whether Section 230 is where Congress should be focusing uh, its resources. So to begin, I'd like to ask everyone the same question, and this is probably at once the easiest question to answer and the most difficult um, because it's exceedingly vague. Uh, what does the difference between good and bad content moderation look like? Start with you, Mr. Huffman. Um, thank you, Congressman, for that uh, philosophically impossible question. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, but I, I think there's a couple easy answers that I hope everybody on this panel would agree with. Bad content moderation is ignoring the problem. Um, and that was the situation we were in pre-230. Uh, and that was the sort of perverse incentives we were facing. Um, there are, I think there are many forms of good content moderation. Uh, what is important to us at Reddit is uh, twofold. One, empowering our users and communities to uh, to set standards of discourse in their communities and amongst themselves. We think this is the only truly scalable solution. Um, and the second is the, uh, what 230 provides us, which is the ability to look deeply in our platform, to investigate, to um, use some finesse and nuance when we're addressing new challenges. Thank you. Ms. Powell. Answer this to be about what makes bad, what makes content bad, or was it what makes Content moderation. moderation. Ah, okay. It's all about between, what's the difference between good and bad content moderation? Moderation, that okay. Because um, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, no, of course, but it precedes the question of why we're here. That is, what kinds of harms get us to the table right. to say why we should even try to talk about changing Section 230. Um, and I would say what's, what's bad or incredibly troubling is when sites are permitted to have an entire business model, which is abuse and harm. Uh, so, by my lights, that is the worst of the worst, and sites that induce and solicit illegality and harm, right. and that to me is the most troubling. And that's the problem, but then the question is how to deal with the problem in terms and of And I, I got some answers for you, but, you know, if, uh, if we want to wait to do you that. You could submit them to us in writing if you'd like. I did in my testimony. We've I understand got that. We've got dealing with the bad Samaritans and then a broader approach. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McSherry. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I actually think it's a great question. And I think as someone who supports civil liberties online as sort of a primary goal for us, I think good content moderation is precise, transparent, and careful. What we see far too often is that in the name of, of content moderation and, and making sure the internet is safe for everybody, actually all kinds of valuable and lawful content is taken offline. There's details about this submitted in our testimony, but I just point to one example where um, we have an archive of, there's an archive of videos attempting to document war atrocities, but those videos are often flagged as violating um, uh, terms of service because of course they contain horrible material, but the point is to actually um, support political conversations and, um, and it's very difficult for the service providers to apparently tell the difference. Thank you. Ms. Peters. Um, if it's illegal in real life, it ought to be illegal online. Content moderation ought to focus on illegal activity. And I think there has been little investment uh, in technology that would improve this for, for the platforms because precisely because of Section 230 immunities. Thank you. I do realize I'm out of time. I'm sorry I asked such a broad question of all of you, but I would like to get your response, if I could, the final two uh, witnesses here uh, in writing, if I could, please. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and now I recognize Mr. Carter for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. I, I, I know that you all understand how important this is, and I, I hope that you, and I believe you all take it seriously. So thank you for being here, and thank you for, for participating in this. Ms. Peters, I'm going to start with you. I'd like to ask you, in your testimony, you pointed out that there is clearly quite a bit of illegal conduct that the online platforms still are hosting. Uh, for instance, illegal pharmacies, uh, where you can buy pills without, without a prescription. Um, terrorists that are profiteering off of uh, looted artifacts. And, and also products um, from, from endangered species. And then it even gets worse. You mentioned the sale of human remains and, and child exploitation. I mean, just gross things, if you will. How, how much effort do you feel like the platforms are putting into to containing this and to, and to stopping this? Uh, well, it, it depends on the platform, um, and that, and, but that's a very good question. And I'd like to respond with a question to you and to the committee. When was the last time anybody here saw a dick pic on Facebook? Simple question. If you, they can keep genitalia off of these platforms. They can keep drugs off these platforms. They can keep child sexual abuse off these platforms. The technology exists. It's, these are policy issues, whether it's the policy to, to allow the uh, uh, video of Nancy Pelosi on or, or the policy to allow uh, pictures of human genitalia. I, I get it. I understand. Let me ask you this. Do you ever go to them and meet with them and, and express this to them? Absolutely. And how are you received? We are typically told that uh, the firm has quite intelligent people working on it, that they're creating AI, and that in a few years that AI is going to work. And when we've presented evidence of specific identifiable crime networks and terror networks, um, we've been told that they'll get back to us and then they don't. That's happened multiple times. Are you ever told that they don't want to meet with you? I mean, are... No, we've usually gotten meetings or calls. So you feel like it's, I mean, you feel like you got a good relationship, and do you feel like oh, the well, effort is being put forth? I don't feel like effort is being put forth. I feel like... You see, that's where I struggle, because I don't want made. the, you know, I'm doing my best to keep the federal government out of this. I don't want to stifle innovation, and I'm, I'm really concerned about that, but at the same time, look, we cannot allow this to go on. That, this is irresponsible. And if you don't do it, then you're going to force us to do it for you. And I don't want that to happen. I, I mean, it's just as, as clear as that. Let me ask you, Ms. Peters, you, you also mentioned in your testimony that you were getting funding from the State Department to map wildlife supply chains. And that's when you discovered that there was a, uh, a large retail market for endangered species that, that exists on some platforms like Facebook and, and WeChat. Have the, any of the any of these platforms made a commitment uh, to to stop this? And if they have, is it working? Is it getting any better? 
I mean, that's a terrific example to bring up, sir. The, the, a number of tech firms have joined a coalition with World Wildlife Fund and IFA uh, uh, and have taken a pledge to remove endangered species content and wildlife markets from their platforms by 2020. I'm not aware that anything has, ch has changed. We've, we, we have researchers going online and logging um, uh, wildlife markets all the time. All right, I'm going to be fair. Okay, I'm going to be fair, and I'm going to let um, I'm going to let the, the um, Google. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see that far. I'm going to let you respond to that. You feel like you're doing everything you can. Thank you. Um, we can always do more. I think we are committed to always doing more. On, on I, I, I appreciate that. I know that. I don't need you to tell me that. I need you to tell me we, we got a plan in place and it's fixed and then stop this. Let me tell you what we are doing in the two categories that you mentioned. So for wildlife, um, the sale of endangered species prohibited from Google Ads. We are part of the coalition that Ms. Peters mentioned. Um, on the, the national epidemic that you mentioned for opioids, we are hugely committed to helping and playing our part in combating this epidemic. So there's a online component and an offline component. The online component, the research has showed that less than 0.05% of misuse of opioids originates on the internet. And what we have done, especially with Google search, is work with the FDA. So the FDA can send us a warning letter if they see that there's a link in search for a robe pharmacy, and we will delist that out of search. Then there's a really important offline component too. So we work with the DEA on prescription take-back day. We've featured these places in Google Maps, on CVS. Um, happy to come in and-, and Okay, and, and, and I invite you to do just that, okay? I'd, li I'd like to see you and talk to you further about this. Mr. Huffman, I'm gonna give you the opportunity because we've gone, my staff has gone on Reddit and they have, they have Googled, if you will, or searched for illegal drugs and it comes up. And yes, I suspect sir. you're going to tell me the same thing. We are working on it. We almost got it under control, but it's still coming up. I've got a slightly different answer, if you'll indulge me. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, it is against our rules to have controlled goods on our platform. Um, and it's also illegal. 230 doesn't give us protection against criminal liability. We do see content like that on our platform. And in fact, if you went to any technology service which is with a search bar, including your own emails, and typed in by Adderall, I'm sure you would find a hit in your spam folder at least. And that's the case on Reddit as well. That sort of content uh, that's come up today is spam first, gets removed by our filters, but there is a lag sometimes between something being submitted and something being removed. Naturally, that's how the system works. That said, we do uh, take this issue very seriously, and so our technologies have continued to improve uh, uh, along these lines. And that's exactly the sort of um, ability that 230 gives us, is the ability to look for this content and remove it. Now, to the extent that you or your staff have found this content specifically, and to the extent that it's still on our platform, um, we'd be happy to follow up later because it shouldn't be. You know, I, I, my sons are grown now, but I feel like a parent pleading with their child again, please don't make me have to do this. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The, uh, the gentleman yields back, and um, now I recognize Congresswoman Kelly for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for holding this important hearing on Section 230 and fostering a healthier, more consumer-friendly internet. The intended purpose of Section 230 was to allow companies to moderate content under the Good Samaritan provision, and yet this law seems to be widely misapplied. The Good Samaritan provision in Section 230 was intended in a good faith in good faith to restrict access or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd, uh, lascivic, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. Last Congress, Section 230 was amended through SESTA and FOSTA to make platforms liable for any activity related to sex trafficking. Since passage, some have criticized the law for being too ambiguous. In addition to my work on this committee, I chair the House Tech Accountability Caucus. In that capacity, I've sought to work with stakeholders to protect family users in an accountable manner while allowing innovators to innovate. Today, as we look to foster a healthier, more consumer-friendly internet, it is my hope that our discussion will set the standard of doing so in a responsible, effective, and balanced way. 
Professor Citron, in your testimony, you discussed giving platforms immunity from liability if they could show that their content moderation practices writ large, writ large are reasonable. As the chairman referenced, how should companies know where the line is for if they're doing enough? Where's that line? And the sort of um, genius of reasonableness is that we, it, it matters and depends on the context. There's certainly some baseline presumptions, I would say defaults, about what would constitute reasonable content moderation practices, and that includes having them. There are some sites that don't engage in it at all. In fact, they, they absolutely don't engage in moderation, and they encourage abuse and illegality. Uh, but there are some baseline, I think, academic writing for the last 10 years and work I've done with companies for 10 years is there is a baseline set of speech rules and policies that we've seen that are best practices, but naturally that's gonna change depending on the challenge. So we're gonna have different approaches to different new and evolving challenges, and that's why a reasonableness approach which preserves the liability shield, right? But it does it in exchange for those efforts and would you agree that any changes we make, we have to ensure that it doesn't further ambiguity? Right, and I think just to, if I may, about FOSTA and SESTA, what was, what was disappointing to someone who certainly helped some offices work on the language is when you included the language knowingly facilitate, that incur that's the moderator's dilemma. That is to either sit on your hands or to be overly aggressive. And so my biggest disappointment was unfortunately how it came out. Because we do see, we almost see ourselves back to Prodigy and CompuServe, those initial cases. And either we are seeing way overly aggressive responses to sexual expression online, which is a shame, and we see the doing nothing. So I hope we don't do that. Thank you. The way people communicate is changing rapidly, as we all know. Information can start on one platform and jump to another and go viral very quickly. The 2016 election showcased how false information can spread and how effective it can be to motivate or deter different populations. Often offensive content is first shared in groups and then filtered out to a wider audience. Ms. Peters. What do you believe is the responsibility of tech companies to monitor and proactively remove content that is rapidly spreading before being flagged by users? I believe that um, companies need to moderate and remove content uh, when it is it concerns an, an, a clearly illegal activity. Um, if it's illegal in real life, it ought to be illegal to host it online. Drug trafficking, human trafficking, uh, wildlife trafficking, serious organized crime and designated terror groups should not be given space to operate uh, on our platforms. Um, I also think that CDA 230 needs to be revised to provide more opportunities for uh, civil and state law enforcement, uh, or, sorry, state and local law enforcement um, to have the legal tools uh, to respond to illicit activity. That's one of the reasons FOSTA-SESTA was passed. And Ms. Oyama and Mr. Huffman, what steps are you taking beyond machine learning to stop the spread of extremist or misinformation content when it's being shared widely? Are there flags that pop up if the same content is shared 10,000 or 100,000 times? Yes, thank you for the question. So on YouTube, we are using um, machines and algorithms. Once a content is identified and removed, our technology prevents it from being re-uploaded. But I think to your really important point about working across platforms and cross-industry collaboration. A good example would be the GIFCT, the Global Internet Forum to um, counter terrorism. We are one of the founding members. Um, many of the leading players in tech are part of that. Um, one of the things that we saw during the, the Christchurch shooting was how quickly this type of content can spread. And we were, um, we were grateful to see that last week some of the crisis protocols we put into place um, kicked in. So there was a shooting in Germany. Um, there was a, a piece of content that appeared on Twitch, and the companies were able to engage in the crisis protocol. There was a hash made of the content. It was spread across the companies, and that enabled all of us to um, block it. I know I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, the general lady yields back, and Mr. Bilirakis is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it very much. My first question is for Dr. McSherry, a yes or no. I understand in the past, EFF has argued for including language mirroring 
uh, legislation and trade deals explicitly for the purpose of baking language into an agreement to protect statute, uh, statute uh, domestically, the statute domestically. Do you see the intent of including such uh, 230 like language in trade agreements is to ensure that we may not revisit the statute? No. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, and then what I'd like to do, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask that uh, EFF, uh, the blog post from January 23rd, 2018, by Jeremy Malcolm, be uh, entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, next question is for uh, Mr. Hoffman uh, and Ms. Uh, Oyama. I wanted to say it right. Is that okay? All right, very good, thank you. In April 2018, I questioned Mark Zuckerberg about how soon illegal opioid ads would be removed from their uh, website. His answer was that the ads would be reviewed when they were flagged by users as being illegal or inappropriate. This, of course, is a standard answer in the social media space. However, Mr. Zuckerberg uh, also said at the time that industry needs to, and I quote, build tools that proactively go out and identify ads for opioids before people even have, have to flag them for us to review. And that ends the quote. This would significantly, in my opinion, cut down the time an illegal ad would be on their website. Uh, again, Ms., uh, Mr. Huffman and Ms. Oyama, uh, it has been a year and a half. This is an epidemic and people are dying. I'm sure you agree with this. Has the industry been actively working on artificial intelligence flagging standards that can automatically identify illegal ads? And then what is the status of this technology and when can we expect implementation if they have been working on it? Uh, whoever would like to go first is fine. Mr. Hoffman? Sure, thank you, Congressman. So Reddit's a little different than our peers in that all of our ads go through a strict human review process, um, making sure that not only are they uh, on the right side of our content policy, which prohibits the buying and selling of controlled substances, um, but also our much more strict ads policy, um, which has a, a much higher bar to cross because we do not want ads that cause any sort of controversy on our platform. Okay, uh, but I mean, you know, we have to be proactive as far as this is concerned, and uh, Mr. Zuckerberg in indicated that, that that's the case. Uh, you know, these kids are, are dying, people are dying, and, and uh, we just can't stand by and have this happen, and have access to these, uh, well, in most cases, uh, opioids and drugs, uh, different types of drugs. But uh, Ms. Soyoma, would you like to comment, please? Thank you. Um, we certainly agree with your comment about the need for proactive efforts. Um, so on Google Ads, we have uh, something called a risk engine that helps us identify if an ad is bad when it's coming into the system. We can kick it out. Last year in 2018, we kicked out 2.3 billion ads out of our system for violating our policies. Um, for any prescription that would show up in an ad, that's also independently verified by an uh, independent uh, group called Legit Script. So that would need to also be uh, verified by them. And then, of course, in the specific case of opioids, those are a controlled substance under federal law. So there's a lot of important work that we've done with the DEA, with the FDA, um, even with pharmacies like CVS offline to help them promote things like um, take back your drugs day where people can take opioids in and drop them off so they're not misused um, later on. One of the things that we've seen is that the vast majority, um, more than 99% of opioid misuse happens in the offline world. So from um, a doctor that's prescribing it or a family member or a friend. And so using technology to also educate um, and inform um, people that might be potentially victimized from this is, is equally important to some of the work that we're doing in the ad space. Okay, uh, how about uh, anyone else on the panel? Did, would they like to comment? Is the industry doing enough? I don't think the industry is doing enough. Uh, there's an enormous amount of um, drug sales taking place on um, Google groups, on Instagram, on Facebook groups. We, the, the groups on these platforms are the epicenter, and this is why industry has to be monitoring this. If you leave this up to users to flag it, 
uh, and they're inside a private or secret group, it's just not going to happen. Um, th th these firms know what users are getting up to. They're monitoring all of us all the time so they can sell us stuff. They can figure this out. Yeah. Con Congressman, can I also add that there are two issues here. There are the ads, but there's also the native content. So you heard Ms. Peter say that she went this morning and searched on Reddit, and that content is there even if it's not in the ads. And the same is true on Google Search. I can search for this. So there's two places you have to worry about these good things, point. not just the ads. Yeah, very good. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now I um, call on the chairman of our full committee for five minutes, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to start with uh, Ms. Oyama. In your written testimony, you discuss YouTube's community guidelines for hate speech, and I'm concerned about news reports that hate speech and abuse is on the rise on social media platforms. How does Section 230 incentivize platforms to moderate such speech, and does Section 230 also incentivize platforms to take a hands-off approach to removing hate speech, if you will? Thank you so much um, for the question. So on the category of hate speech, YouTube prohibits hate speech. We have a very clear policy against it. So that would be speech that incites violence or speech that is um, hateful against groups with specific attributes. So that could be speech based on their, their race, their religion, their sex, their age, their disability status, their veteran status. And so that is prohibited. Um, it can be either detected by our machines, which is the case in more than 87%, by community flaggers, um, by individual users. And all of those actions that we take, um, last quarter, um, we saw a 5x increase in the amount of content that our machines were able to find um, and remove. Those removals are vitally dependent on the protection in CDA 230 to give service providers the ability to moderate content, to find bad content, and to take it down. Um, we do have claims against us when we remove speech. People may sue us for defamation. Um, they may have other legal claims. And 230 is what enables you know, not only Google or not only YouTube, but any site with user comments, with user-generated content, um, any site on the internet, large or small, to be able to moderate that content. So um, yeah, I think we would just encourage Congress to think about not harming the good actors, the innocent actors that are taking these steps um, in an effort to go after a truly bad criminal actor where criminal law is fully exempted from the scope of CDA 230. And, and they should be penalized. Um, and law enforcement will play a really important role in bringing them down, as they did with Backpage that was taken down, um, or in civil cases like roommates.com, where there is platform liability for bad actors that break the law. Thank you. Dr. Farid, in your written testimony, you state that the internet has led to the proliferation of domestic and international terrorism. As you may know, there's both criminal and civil liability associated with providing material support for terrorism. But I want to start with Dr. McSherry. Understanding that Section 230 doesn't apply to federal criminal law, have U.S. social media companies used Section 230 to shield themselves from civil liability for allowing their platforms to be used as propaganda and recruitment platforms for terrorists with regard to civil liability? Um, so there are, um, there are ongoing cases, and there have been several cases, where um, uh, platforms have been accused of violating civil laws um, for hosting certain kinds of content on their, on their platforms. And they've invoked Section 230 in, in those cases quite successfully. Um, and I think that's not, if you look at the facts of a lot of these cases, that's actually quite appropriate. It's, the reality is it's very difficult for a platform to always be able to tell in advance I uh, always draw the line in advance between content that's talking, that's simply protected political communications, and content that, that steps over a line. Um, and so these cases are hard and they're complicated and they have to get resolved on their facts. Section 230, though, also creates a space in which, because of, um, because of the additional protections that it provides, it creates a space for uh, service providers, when they choose to, to moderate and enforce their own policies. Let me ask you to go back to Dr. Freed. Do you have any thoughts on how this should be addressed from a technological perspective? Yeah. Um, I, I want to start by saying, you know, when you hear about the moderation that is happening today, we've heard it from Google, we've heard it from Reddit, you, you should understand that that has only come after intense pressure. It has come from pressure from uh, advertisers, it has come from pressure on Capitol Hill, it has come from pressure in the EU, and it has come from pressure from the press. 
So there is bad news, there's bad PR, and then we start getting serious. For years, we have been struggling with the social media companies to do more about extremism and terrorism online, and we have hit a, blank, a, a hard wall. And then the EU started putting pressure, Capitol Hill started putting pressure, advertisers started pr putting pressure, and we started getting responses. And I think this is exactly what this conversation is about, is what is the underlying motivating factor? The self-regulation of trust us, we will do everything is, is not working. So the pressure has to come from other avenues. And I think putting pressure by modest uh, changes to CDA 230 is the right direction. And I agree with Ms. O Oyama, is that if these are good actors, then they should encourage that change and help us clean up and deal with the problems that we are dealing. But I do, you know, I've been in this, fight for over a decade now, and it's a very consistent pattern. You deny the problem exists, you minimize the extent of it, you deny the technology exists, and eventually you get enough pressure, and then we start making changes. I think we should just skip to the end part of that <laughs> and just recognize that we can do better and let's just start doing better. All right, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back, and now I uh, recognize for five minutes Congressman Gianforte. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today. About 20 years ago, I harnessed the power of the internet to launch a business to improve customer service. That company was called Right Now Technologies, and from a spare bedroom in our home, uh, we eventually grew that business to be one of the largest employers in Montana. Uh, we had about 500 high-wage jobs there. Uh, the platform we created had about 8 million unique uh, visitors per day. Uh, and I understand how important Section 230 can be for small business. Uh, this important liability shield has gotten mixed up, however, with complaints about viewpoint discrimination. And I want to cite one particular case. In March of this year, uh, Missoula-based Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation reached out to my office uh, because Google had denied one of their advertisements. Uh, the foundation did what it had done many times. They had tried to use paid advertising on the Google network to promote a short video about a father hunting with his daughter. This time, however, the foundation received an email from Google, and I quote, any promotions about hunting practices, even when they are intended as a healthy method of population control or conservation, is considered animal cruelty and deemed inappropriate to be shown on our network. The day I heard about this, I sent a letter to Google, and you were very responsive, but the initial position taken was absurd. Hunting is a way of life in Montana and many parts of the country. Uh, I'm very thankful that you worked quickly to reverse that. Uh, but I remain very concerned about Google's effort to stifle the promotion of Rocky Mountain Elk Foundations and how they were treated. I worry that other similar groups have faced similar efforts to shut down their advocacy. We really don't know how many hunting ads Google has blocked in the last five years. In my March letter, I invited Google's CEO to meet with leaders of our outdoor uh, recreation businesses in Montana uh, I haven't heard anything back, and Ms. Oyama, I would extend the invitation again. Um, I think, frankly, it would help Google uh, to get out of Silicon Valley, come to Montana, sit down with some of your customers, and hear from them directly about the things that are important to them. I'd be happy to host that visit. We'd love to meet with you there. It, I think it's important to understand the work that these groups do to further conservation and to help species thrive. Uh, and as an avid hunter and outdoorsman myself, I know many businesses in Montana uh, focus on hunting and fishing. And I worry they may be denied the opportunity to advertise on one of the largest online platforms that you've built, to your credit. I also worry that an overburdensome regulatory regime could hurt small businesses and stifle Montana's rapidly growing high-tech sector. Uh, so the invitation's open. Dr. Farid, I would, one question for you. How can we walk this line between protecting small business and innovation versus overburdens of regulations? It's absolutely the right question to ask, Congressman. And I think you have to be very careful here because right now we have near monopolies in the technology sector. And if we start regulating now, the small companies coming up are not going to be able to compete. 
There are ways of creating carve-outs uh, in the EU and the UK. As they are talking about regulations, they are creating carve-outs for small platforms that have 8 million versus uh, 3 billion users. So I do think we want to tread very lightly here. Um, I think Ms. Peters also made the point that we want to inspire competition for better business models and allow these small companies. But I think there are mechanisms to do that. We just have to think carefully about it. Yeah, and we've had a lot of discussion today about the efforts you're taking to get criminal activity off the network. So I applaud that. We should continue to do that. But as a follow-on, doctor, um, how do we ensure that content moderation doesn't become censorship and a violation of our First Amendment? Good. So the way we have been thinking about content moderation is a collaboration between humans and computers. So what, what computers are very good at doing is the same thing over and over and over again. But what they're not good at still is nuance and subtlety and complexity and inference and context. So the way content moderation works today, for example, in the child sexual abuse space is human moderators say, this is a child, this is sexually explicit. We fingerprint that content and then we remove very specifically and very targeted that piece of content. False alarm rates for photo DNA that we developed a decade ago are about one in 50 billion. That's the scale you need to be operating at. So if you are going to deploy technology, you have to be at a very, automatic technology, you have to be operating at a very high scale. And so the humans, the computers can't do that on their own, so we need more human moderators. You heard from Google, 10,000 moderators. There are 500 hours of video uploaded a minute. That is not enough moderators. You can do the arithmetic yourself. Those moderators would be, have to be looking at hours and hours of video per hour. So we have to also beef up our human moderation. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Oyama, I look forward to seeing you in Montana. And I yield back. The, the gentleman yields back. Um, and now I recognize, um, is it? It is. Um, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester is next for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and to the chairman and ranking members, uh, thank you for holding this important hearing. I think many of us here today are seeking to more fully understand how Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act can work well in an ever-changing virtual and technological world. This hearing is really significant, and as uh, Ms. Oyama said, I want us to not forget the important things that the internet has provided to us, from movements to applications to TikTok. Um, but also, as Mr. Huffman said, we, and I, you, you applied it to Reddit, but I think it applies to all of us, must constantly be evolving. Our policies must be evolving to face the new challenges, while also balancing our civil liberties. I mean, so we have a really important balance here. So um, my, my questions really um, are surrounded uh, around this, the, the bad, the question that Mr. Lopesack asked about bad content mo um, uh, moderation. And I wanna start off by saying that the, the utilization of machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence to filter through content posted on websites as large as YouTube provides an important technological solution to increasing the amount of content to moderate. However, as we become more and more reliant on algorithms, we are increasingly finding blind spots and gaps that may be difficult to breach with simply more and better code. I think there's a real concern that groups already facing prejudice and discrimination will be further marginalized and censored. So, and as I thought about this, I even thought about groups like the veterans or the African American community in the 2016 elections. Uh, Dr. Farid, can you describe some of the challenges with moderation by algorithm, including possible bias? Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right, Congresswoman. When we automate at the scale of the internet, we are going to have problems, and we've already seen that. We know, for example, that face recognition does much, much worse on women, on people of color than it does on white men. Um, the, the problem with the, the automatic uh, moderation is that um, it doesn't work at scale. When you are talking about billions of uploads, and if your algorithm is 99% accurate, which is very, very good, you are still making one in 100 mistakes. That is literally tens of millions of mistakes a day you're going to be making at the scale of the internet. And so the, 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 the underlying idea that we can fully automate this not to take on the responsibility and the expense of hiring human moderators simply doesn't work. And so I, I fear that we have moved too far to the, give us time to find the AI algorithms 
and um, because we don't want to hire the human moderators because of the expense. And, and we know today that that is not going to work in the next year, two years, five years, 10 years. And it's a little bit worse than that because it also assumes an adversary that is not adapting. And we know that the adversaries can adapt. So we know, for example, that all machine learning and AI algorithms today that are meant to identify content are vulnerable to what are called adversarial attacks. Um, you can add small amounts of content to the information and you can completely fool the systems. I wanna ask a quick question of uh, Mr. Huffman and Ms. Oyama. Um, both of you talked about the number of human moderators that you have available to you. And I know that we've had many hearings on challenges of diversity in the tech field. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, Mr. Huffman, yours are more from the user perspective in terms of moderators, or are they people that you hire? And, and the 10,000 or so that you mentioned, these are people that you hire? or are they users? Just a quick, so everybody knows. Users, so combination. For, for us, it's about 100 employees out of 500. Employees. And of course, millions of users participate gotcha. as well. That's what I thought, okay, same. Yep, so the 10,000 stat that I mentioned is the mixture of the full-time employees. We also work with specialized vendors, and then we also have community flagging, which could be an NGO, could be law enforcement, could be an average user. Okay, I know in the interest of time, I don't have a lot of time, but it would be, could you provide us with information on the diversity of your moderators? Um, that's one of, uh, one of my questions. Um, and then also, um, I, I'm, I don't like to make assumptions, but I'm gonna assume that it might be a challenge to find um, diverse uh, populations of individuals to do this role, what you're doing in that vein. So if we could have a follow-up with that. And then my last question is just gonna be, um, for the panel, um, what should the federal government, what should we be doing to help um, in, in this space? Because I'm, I'm really concerned about the capacity to do this and do it well. Um, if anybody has any suggestion, recommendation, Mr. Farid is already pushing his button. I, I think this conversation is helping. Um, I think you're gonna scare the bejesus out of the technology sector and I think that's a really good thing to do. Okay, I, my, I'm, I have to yield back, I'm out of time, but thank you so much to all of you for your work. The gentleman woman yields back, and now last but not least, um, Representative Soto, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. It's, uh, I'm the last one, so if you're, in the, you're in the home stretch here. It's amazing that we're here today. Um, when we think about how far the internet has progressed, uh, one of the greatest inventions in human existence, um, connecting the world, giving billions a voice, um, while before their stories would never be told, providing uh, knowledge at our fingertips. Uh, uh, it's just incredible. And we know Section 230 has been a big part of it, uh, providing that safe harbor against a dam, the, essentially the dam holding back a flood of lawsuits. Uh, it's per created innovation, um, but it's also created a breeding ground for defamation and harassment, for impersonation and elect election interference, and a, also breeding ground for white supremacists, disinformation, global terrorism, and other extremism. So we have these wonderful gifts to humanity on one side, and then all the terrible things with humanity on the other side. Um, my biggest concern is that lies spread faster than the speed of light in uh, in the internet while, uh, while truth seems to go at a snail's pace. Uh, so that's one thing that I constantly hear from my constituents. So I wanna start with some basics just so I know everybody's opinion on it. Who do you all each think should be the cop on the beat to be the primary enforcer uh, with the choices being FCC, FTC, or the courts? And it'd be great to go down the line to hear what each of you think uh, on that. If those are my only three options, I would choose the You could give the a courts. fourth if you could give a one word, um, <clears throat> a few word answer. Uh, I think in the United States society and on our platform, our users. Okay. Who do you think should be the cop on the beat? I'm going to take your second back, best, best option, which is the courts. Courts. Um, because it forces, in some sense, the companies actually to be the norm producers. Okay. Dr. McSherry. Yes, um, so I think the courts have a very important role to play, but also a cardinal principle for us at EFF is at the end of the day, users should be able to control their, their internet experience. Okay. We need to have many, many more tools for, to make that possible. Ms. Peters. 
Uh, I think that's a ridiculous argument. The vast majority of people, st I study organized crime. Well, let's get back to Hold on, I'm going to answer courts? the I'm going to answer the question FTC. courts and law enforcement. Thank you. Most people are good. A small percentage of people statistically in any community commit crime. Okay. Ms. You have to control for it. Thank you. Ms. Oyama. Content moderation has always been a multi-stakeholder approach, but I wanted to point out that the courts um, and the FTC do have jurisdiction. Um, and as you know, the FTC does have broad jurisdiction over tech companies already, and courts are always looking at the outer contours of CDA 230 scope. Thank you. Dr. Free. I agree this is a multi-stakeholder. We all have a responsibility here. And uh, if we were to tighten up rules on the courts, it'd be great to hear, um, first starting with you, Dr. Fareed, if we limit it to injunctive relief, um, um, do you think that would be enough and whether or not there should be attorney's fees at stake? Please understand, I'm not a policymaker, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a technologist. So I don't think, you, you, I'm not the one who should be answering that question with, with due respect. Okay, Ms. Oyama and Mr. Huffman, um, would injunctive relief in the courts be enough to change certain behaviors, you think? I think I'd just say courts do have the power of injunctive relief. Um, I would want to echo the small businesses and startup voices where they do say that the framework has created certainty and that is essential for their content moderation and their economic viability. Thank you. Mr. Huffman. Similar answer, sir. Um, I, I would shudder to think what would happen if we, when we were smaller, or even now, were on the receiving end of armies of toy lawyers. Um, Ms. Citron, I see you nodding quite a bit. Injunctive relief, attorney's fees, are these things that we should be looking at? So I, I just, I, as you say, injunctive relief, all I can see is the First Amendment and prior restraints. So I think we, we need to be sort of careful in the kinds of remedies that we think about. But law operates, if we allow law to operate, if people act with unreasonably and recklessly, then I think the array of possibilities should be available. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, 230, uh, Section 230, as far as being incorporated in our trade deals. I'm from Orlando, the land where a fictional mouse and a, uh, a fictional wizard are two of our greatest uh, assets. Uh, Ms. Peters, uh, I know you talked a little bit about the issue of including uh, 230 in trade deals. How would that be problematic for a region like ours, where intellectual property is so critical? It's, uh, it's problematic because it potentially is going to tie Congress's hands from reforming the bill down the line, and, and that's precisely uh, why industry is pushing to have it inside the trade deal. There are 90 pages of co copyright language in existing okay. U.S. trade agreements. I think CDA 230 can just be treated the same. It's U.S. law. It doesn't bind Congress's hands at all. So if we adjusted laws here, that would affect the trade deals, is your opinion there? There's no language in the trade deals that binds Congress's hands. Congress regularly has hearings on copyright, patent, pharmaceuticals, labor, climate, CDA 230. There's nothing in the trade agreement, the template language of US law, to create a US framework when countries like China and Russia are developing their own frameworks for the internet. There's nothing in the current USMCA or the US-Japan FTA that would limit your ability to later look at 230 and decide that it needs tweaks later on. Thanks, you yield back. Gentleman yields back, and that concludes our period for questioning. And now, um, I uh, seek unanimous consent to put into the record um, a letter from Creative Future with attachments, a letter from American Hotel and Lodging Association, a letter from Consumer Technology Association, a letter from Travel Technology Association, a white paper from Airbnb, a letter from Common Sense Media, a letter from Computer and Con uh, Communications Industry Association, a letter from Representative Ed Grace, a letter from uh, a letter in support of the uh, plan plan act, um, a letter from the I2 coalition, a letter for uh, a letter to the FCC from Representative Gianforte, uh, a letter from Tech Freedom, a letter from the Inter uh, Internet Association, a letter from the um, Wik Wikimedia Foundation a letter from the Motion Picture Association, an article from The Verge titled Searching for Help, a, a statement from R Street. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Um, and let me thank, where am I? 
Let me thank uh, our witnesses. I think this was a really useful um, hearing. I think um, those of you who have um, suggestions, more concrete ones than sometimes came up today, uh, our committee would appreciate it very, very much. I'm sure the joint committee would uh, appreciate that as, as well, this joint hearing. Um, so I want to thank all of you so much for your thoughtful presentations and for the written testimony, which also often went way beyond what we were able to, uh, to, to hear today. Um, and so I want to remind members that pursuant to uh, committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record uh, to be answered by witnesses who have appeared. And I want to ask witnesses to please respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. And at this time, the committee, the committees um, are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>